Uh, my name is Ezra Mathias. Uh, one of the one housekeeping item I would like to share with you is this workshop or these workshops are using multiple modalities, which may from time to time um, um, interrupt the proceedings and may not go as smooth as we like it to. But it's a novel um, approach, as um, stated by one of our UN uh, UNESCO um, participants. And so you have to bear with us. Once again, uh, this conference workshop is about implementing the 2003 convention for the safeguarding of intangible cultural heritage at the national level in Grenada. And this will be taking place at the Coyoga Hotel from March, 11, March 7th to March 11, 2022. This is a seminal event and it's seminal because I think for the first time, individuals will be learning a variety of techniques and how to inventory, how to safeguard and how to transmit or the transmission mechanism for sharing, for imbuing Grenada's cultural heritage. And if we are successful, we will have, you will have indeed um, find ways to diffuse Grenadian identity. You know, most countries had a civilization, Grenada did not, but we have traditions and we have symbols and, and icons that we can share um, so that we can, from generation to generation, the Grenadian identity will persist. This morning we have Nigel Encalada, who will be conducting the workshops. He's a technical advisor on the project. He'll be conducting the workshops um, from a report site. Nigel. Hi, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good to, good to see all of you. Uh, Ezra pointed out that I, that I am participating remotely. And of course, I, I wish I was there with you, but the, the sanitary conditions are not quite there yet that we, but we, we anticipate that in subsequent workshops, we'll, we'll be there physically with you as we go through this process of implementing the convention in Grenada. But thank you for, for having me and uh, for the privilege of being with you for the course of the coming week. Thank you, Ezra. We also have, we also have Daryl Bratwaite, who is the chairperson of the event. And we have Adriana Rojas, who is the coordinator of the project. I just wanna give you a bio sketch of each of the participants, because I think this is important. It lends to the integrity of uh, the event and um, the expertise of individuals who are participating. Mr. Encalada is a senior UNESCO facilitator for the implementation of the 2003 Convention for the Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage and is currently a member of the 12 person evaluation body that reviews nominations at the international level for the inscription of cultural elements to the various lists of intangible cultural heritage of humanity, as well as requests for international assistance. From 2009 to 2021, Nigel was the director of Belize's Institute for Social and Cultural Research of the National Institute of Culture and History. He was also the editor of the Journal of Belizean Studies from 2007 to 2009 and was a teacher and lecturer of history, economics, and research methods at St. John's College from 1997 to 2009. Ms. Adriana Rojas has been a nonprofit consultant residing in Grenada since 2017. She has over seven years of experience in grant writing, project coordination, and fundraising in Grenada, the US, Venezuela, and Spain, including um, the fundraising for deaf children, holistic healthcare, tourism, and development projects. She attended the online training for periodic reporting in the Latin America and Caribbean region. She will be 
uh, of Project Coordinator. And lastly, you have um, Ezra Matthias. Um, Ezra Matthias is an international development educator with over two decades of experience in the end-to-end -end stages of educational programs and projects. He specializes in policy economics, organizational leadership and management. With his, uh, with his brother, Dr. Dwight Matthias, Dr. Matthias founded the Matthias Group. This Grenada-based organization collaborates with the Grenada Diabetes Association to deliver critical technical assistance to diabetes education and awareness programs, including care management. Aside from running the Matthias Group as the managing director, Dr. Matthias is a former education administrator. He's a retired educator who has taught public policy analysis at the United States Department of Agriculture Graduate School and John Jay College, City University of New York, and economics at St. Francis College in Brooklyn, New York. Dr. Matthias is also a published author uh, on education capacity building. His research centered on topics including rates of return, the minority males investment in education, globalization and education reform, globalization how nations and people connect, and strategies for revitalizing decaying communities uh, and rethinking development in English speaking Caribbean. And lastly, trafficking in persons, business modeling. He resides in St. George's and Henryville, Pennsylvania. I, before I pass it on to Daryl, I just want to frame the, um, the meeting uh, for the course of the week. Um, I mentioned earlier that this is a seminal event. And what I wanted to do based on the title of the workshops is to deconstruct um, so you have a conceptual understanding of what the workshops are about and what the end goal is about. The first thing I want you to think about is when you think of the title, Proud of My Heritage, Transmission and Safeguarding of the Intangible Cultural Heritage in Grenada through Inventory and Education Initiative. If you deconstruct that title, on one side, you'll have a bunch of action words, a bunch of verbs, transmission, safeguarding, inventory. Those are the skills that everyone who's participating in this event should leave uh, the workshop being able, empowered to go back to the community, go back to the organization to conduct, conduct this work, to do this work. And the, the content knowledge, the content knowledge that you will be picking up, uh, what is intangible cultural heritage? What are education initiatives? And also, what is proud of my heritage? So two things we want to get across to you. One are the skills and the content knowledge that you'll, you'll be able to know and be able to use as you go into your community or your organization or in your neighborhood or wherever you work. Because if we can do that, then we would have the, indeed implemented the workshops as intended. So now I just want to pass uh, the workshop on to Mr. Darrell, Mr. Nigel, so that he can walk you through um, the first segment of this morning's activities. Nigel. Hi, good, good morning, everyone. Good morning. So uh, welcome to, to this workshop, this first workshop on the project entitled Proud of My Heritage, uh, coordinated and brought to you through the Grenada National Trust uh, with support from, from UNESCO. At this time, uh, before we proceed to, to having Daryl bring us up to speed on how we got to this moment and Adriana telling us about the project, I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Yuri Peshkov, uh, who is from the UNESCO Jamaica Cluster Office in, in Jamaica. Uh, Yuri is the, is the program specialist for culture in the Caribbean and uh, Yuri has been the driving force behind uh, getting this project into its current existence. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, we just, uh, just to get a few words from Yuri, help me welcome Yuri Peshkov from the UNESCO cluster office in Jamaica. Welcome Yuri. Thank you very much for this introduction, Nigel. It's, it, it's, a, it's indeed a very happy moment uh, when we are all together, and I, I can see that we have online um, 40 participants at least. Um, that, that was a long way <laughs> to, to this moment. Um, 
we we don't have that many projects uh, supported by the ICH fund in the region in the Caribbean, and um, me working in the uh, Kingston cluster office for the Caribbean that is covering uh, twenty uh, English and Dutch speaking <clears throat> small island development states. It's it's indeed um, a, a very good example of the commitment of the uh, um, uh, vision and care about the heritage of Grenada. So that's um, um, that's why I think that the project is uh, is was really well written, uh, well thought, well developed. That's why um, the uh, the ICH fund approved it, and we we got the approval of the. Of the uh, international uh, ICH International uh, Committee in this regard. So I'm really looking forward to uh, the, this uh, this project, and I think that we we already have uh, good ideas about you know how to disaggregate the title, which which really really incorporates all the all the um, essence of this project. So I'm looking forward to uh, learn from you about the rich living heritage of Grenada. And I hopefully through our um, one of the best facilitators, I would say, uh, Nigel and Kalada, uh, you will learn about uh, the convention and mechanisms, uh, how convention operates with heritage and be empowered by, by, this, uh, by this workshop and following workshops. So thank you very much. And my best wishes to, to the Grenada Heritage Trust, of course. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Yuri. Thank you for being with us here this, this morning. I know you have a, a very busy schedule, but thank you for making the time to, to be with us. At this time then, I'd like to introduce you to someone who is no stranger to, to you, certainly, and I've had the pleasure of, of meeting him uh, in the last couple of years, actually. Uh, Yuri mentioned that it has taken quite some time to, to be here today. We're approaching maybe two years or more, um, but it, fe it feels like yesterday, actually since this, this process started. Uh, I think COVID has had that effect where time has collapsed on itself. And so everything feels like it happened yesterday. And so then it's my pleasure to introduce Daryl Brathwaite from the Grenada National Trust. Daryl, over to you. Uh, thank you. I hope you can all hear. There has to be a switch switching between local broadcast and, and uh, what's coming through. So that's why there's a pause in between speakers. So welcome all, um, government ministers, government departments, community leaders, volunteers, trust, uh, members of UNESCO, our generous sponsor. The ICH is the easy part of heritage. Because heritage, um, there are three components. The built heritage is very expensive, challenging to do. The natural heritage well, is there already, but we still have to conserve. And the tangible cultural heritage, which is basically what we do every day. It's very personal. It's not something that you have to imagine because you see it around you, you experience it yourself. It's very emotional. And the interesting thing about culture and heritage is the emotional aspect. Because sometimes in, in conservation, it's not practical to conserve everything. But there are things that we are emotionally attached to that we try to hang on to for as long as possible anyway. And the challenge with conserving uh, cultural heritage is that traditionally it has been a verbal oral tradition and there's not much tech documentation. Just imagine that one of the important books in humanity, the Bible, wasn't written for the first 400 years, just verbally, orally transmitted from generation to generation. So it's, it's, it's not, nothing new. This is something, an obstacle that all heritage faces, that it starts off with a sort of oral tradition, and gradually people realize that we are losing too much of it. Old people die off, they die with their secrets, or they simply can't remember because of their age. And we lose valuable 
information. The important thing here is that it's a community owned project. We can rely on governments, for example, to do some of the restoration and preservation of the physical heritage. But when it comes to preserving your cultural heritage, this is a family matter, this is a community matter, and it has to be operated and pushed from the ground up. You know, if your family home is burning, um, you get everybody outside to safety, and then you start to reflect on what's inside, maybe you should go back in to rescue. Well, if you think about it, the insurance can cover pretty much everything except the family album. How are you going to recover those pictures of yourself as a baby, your grandparents, new, as a young newly married couple? This is impossible. It's lost forever, lost for all time. This is what we are trying to safeguard here today um, by conducting this workshop so that this becomes an ongoing process that we don't lose too much in the process of our modernization. It, it took the trust a while to get to this point um, because the whole process is a slow one. And really what we are hoping now is that Grenada is ready, that you can feel that there's a groundswell. Putting this actual workshop together was a lot easier than thinking about it two years ago because we can sense that there's a, a very solid response. We've had a fantastic response to the, the invitation to, to invite the, the invitation to attend the workshop. And we are hoping that this energy will continue. Um, it's very much a collaborative event. We are not just the organizers. The people attending the workshop have that's what we left. Good information recruitment in the community. It's your workshop. It's not the National Trust workshop. And sometimes we, we start with just the people we know around us that we have immediate contact with. But you guys out there, you know who in the community has shown sustained interest and who could be recruited to the cause. So please, this is your project. It's working from the ground up. It's the only way it can work and it's the only way it can be sustained. So thank you very much for your interest and your attendance. And let's go guys thank you ezra before i pass it uh back because we have starts at 9 15 pass it back to um to nigel uh, i just want to make a, a, another point about uh the whole idea about safe garden um when we when we we had some discussions about uh the project and the question was you know, what type of organizing principle we can sort of, uh, the context we can lay for this um, important project. And we talked about, um, you know, should, should it be a general policy that could be located in a ministry um, to, um, to showcase and highlight that aspect of cultural heritage? Um, could it, could it be, could we place it in a, in a, in a statutory body or in a local organization that will carry on the tradition that we live on a daily basis? Or should we focus on the, the scientific or the um, technical aspects where individuals will learn the research methodologies to do exactly what Mr. Bradford was talking about? How do we go about documenting, curating so that a lots of lots of the traditions that we have are not endangered that they will persist they will stay alive and they will live in us uh, as individuals as communities and as grenadians because that's what gives us our identity so in terms of safeguarding um we have to really really be very rigorous in the way we approach it it cannot be arbitrary we have to have an organized way of safeguarding these important aspects of grenadian life that we, we, we saw passed on and on and on. Just to give you two examples. Uh, when I was a young man, about eight, nine years old, um, growing up in the, in the community of Belmont, I remember on Carnival Mondays, um, I might be going to visit a friend or going to the, the shop, as we'll say, or going to the beach. There's always individuals who put together some really, really scary masks. You know, they make colorful paper, match it together, bake it, put the eyes, they, 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 they cut in for the mouth, 
and the airs and all, and they put that on and they'll be just walking through the community. And you as a young man walking past that, it was, it used to scare me. I used to be so scared when I have to go through that. That is done, that is gone, it no longer exists. And those are the type of things we do not want to go into history, go into the history books. We want to see them happening over and over again. Another thing on Carnival Tuesdays, we'll have what you have called wild engines will come into the village, the community, you know, clad in their headgear, their wooden axes, their straw skirts, um, their, their bells um, around their ankles, around their ankles and, uh, and uh, around, their around their legs. And they'll be dancing. They'll be dancing, they'll be dancing, they'll be dancing, dancing and they'll, and they'll be, be in circles and all the kids will be around looking at that. You know, um, that's part of our heritage, it's gone. And thirdly, um, and on the same Tuesday, they folks will come in with a big pole, maypole, with ribbons from the maypole, tons of rivers, colorful rivers, and ladies will be dancing. And as they dance, the ribbons will be plaited, right? And then as they continue dancing, they're unplaited. So very rhythmic, very colorful. You know, you feel very proud. It's like, where did this come from? Because I know it didn't come from my community. That is dead. As, as a matter of fact, I saw the performance about five years ago in uh, Santiago de Cuba, in Cuba, um, and I, 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 it warned me. We cannot let these symbols and icons vanish. We have to preserve them. And the way to preserve them is what this conference is about. You have to learn to document, inventory, document, organize. You have to transmit it so that every boy and girl, every man and woman, it will be part of their, their daily lives in terms of thinking about it or even practicing. And also we have to transmit it. These have the kind of an impact this, um, or strategy, the kind of impact this will have um, in the educational setting. Now we can be part of, attached to the school curriculum, okay? Segments of these aspects of our heritage could be attached to the school curriculum. And it wouldn't be very costly because you could add it to a social studies class uh, or you could add it to a general knowledge class. The other thing that this project and this um, documenting and, and, and honing uh, in, um, intangible cultural heritage is about sustainability. How do we sustain it? Also, another impact if we are successful is leadership. How can leaders direct, motivate, align individuals, organizations, communities to really, really play a vital role in safeguarding our intangible cultural heritage? So it requires leadership. It also has a economic component. Think of the jobs and everything I just said, think of the jobs that can be created through curating through education and through um, leading. So once again, I want you to think of this project, of these workshops, the skills you'll be getting and the new knowledge you'll be getting as a attachment of Grenada's advancement, Grenada's development. Development is not only about GNP, you know, how much money we, we make per year as a country. It's also about identity. How can we consolidate our identity? If you take the island of Dominica, for example, every November, every November, individuals go to work in a traditional attire, floral skirts, white blouse, head tie, and there's a male version. Every November that happens. That is an example of preserving, safeguarding cultural heritage. We need that. That defines us. That gives us our identity. So as you go through the workshops, I want you to keep that in mind, okay? We, we, the skills you'll be getting is transmission, how to transmit in, in, in tangible cultural heritage, how to inventory intangible cultural heritage, and you have to be familiar and know and be able to use things like um, the, the content knowledge you'll be getting from the presentations. So I want to pass it on to um, back to Mr. Um, Nigel so he can begin his presentation. 
Thank you very much, Ezra. Uh, we now go over to Adriana Rojas. Adriana, as you know, was... Adriana, as you know, having a, a feedback there. Okay. Mic check, mic check. Mic check, okay. So the um, Adriana, as you know, uh, was instrumental in putting this project together. She's the project coordinator, and she will now introduce us, give us an overview of the project, Proud of My Heritage. Uh, later in the week, at the very end of the week, um, while this is just an overview, Adriana will take us more deeply into the project and what we can anticipate going forward with the implementation of the convention in Grenada. Adriana, welcome and thank you. Right, right. Go ahead. Go ahead. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you uh, for being here. And, and for us, for it's us. important to mention that uh, we are like a pilot project and experiment because this is the first time that this has happened, this type of hybrid. And we are doing uh, all the best in terms of letting more people access to this workshop. So that's where we have more people, not only in Zoom, we have it here in, in, in person, we have more than 10 persons and others that had expressed, they're not able to do it because most of them are teachers. But the beautiful thing of what we envision is that, and what we are implementing has a new technology here as well, is using the, the social media so they will be able to catch it later uh, our, our, YouTube, and our YouTube, YouTube channel and also our, our Facebook cha uh, channel, Facebook channel. So um, for me, it has been quite long that we start this, uh, this beautiful uh, project and uh, we conceive it together with Great Lutheran School as we have this concern and uh, this idea how we put together, how we, uh, how we will we'll engage youth and children, which is the key, the key actors here as well, not only the, the community leaders and the traditional bearers. Uh, so this, this we, we believe that we, we rewrote this project two years or something, but now it's here. So um, I always like to introduce myself all the project that in the role of the National Trust that we are here to guide you. So this is a community-based project designed by you and for you. So I, I like to introduce myself. I'm here to guide you. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and all together, we have to come with these ideas and all the experience and, and that you have and your key role in different sectors. So that's where we are very glad to, hear, uh, to have you here because we have, we have invited uh, community organizations, uh, also cultural practitioners, teachers, principals, uh, representatives, uh, um, officers from the Ministry of Tourism, officers from of Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Culture as well. So uh, let's take advantage of the technology that we have at this moment. And because of that, now we are able to spread the word and to impact positively more people. Um, so uh, in regards to the project, we detected, you will tell, you will ask why, how would we figure it out this? A part of what Daryl Bradway has said before, um, in 2000, between 2015 and 2017, uh, Grenada National Trust conducted a project, an OS project in order to endorse uh, the, some uh, small enterprises here uh, which are more focused or oriented in tourist heritage. So based on that, which is, if you will, if you want to see that project, we can share with you later, there were uh, unexpected uh, findings. So that project, it was more focused on tangible cultural heritage. So maybe there, there are some words that you're not familiarized with because we know that we have youth here to uh, attending today. But that will come later. You you will get that the 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 sense that we're telling you. 
So tangible uh, cultural heritage, those things that you can touch and see, nature and uh, buildings and monuments and so on. And intangible is those abstracts that maybe you cannot see, but at the end you feel it integrating into your into your roots what, when it makes sense for you. So, um, but one of the, some of those findings that we were concerned about, okay, so how we will sustain this, what we will do with these findings. Um, and we saw that, uh, or we detected that most of the small businesses and tradition bearers and cultural practitioners, uh, they expressed it at that moment that they were not feeling fully integrated. So most of the tourists, massive tourists, uh, of course, we're talking about before COVID. <laughs> So um, they were not feeling like exposed and being able to express themselves and to offer their products or the services or why they have to, the beautiful cultural traditions that they have to offer, elements that they have to offer for the public and not only for Canadians, also for the tourists. Another thing that we detected or we identified is that local communities were able to identify um, most of some of most of them tangible, but we're not able maybe to point it out in tangible cultural heritage, and uh, especially and we have a, to highlight this particularly by youth. So our concern on youth and children. So most of them we know because the technology brings us uh, yes good opportunities to to be open to the globalization and have more information and more access. But against that, then on the other hand, we have this, that the youth are feeling more attractive and appealing to Western culture. And they're losing, they're losing that, uh, that transmission from elders, from adults to them, because maybe they don't feel an attracted to it. Or maybe there's not a, a system that we have, we're gonna design it here, and we're going to come together with it by using the technology that we have, the smartphone, computers, tablets, and, and the way that we envision or to implement the curriculum education program is to design uh, a content like more resource guide where teachers and, and, and students of different ages can have access to it and go, let's go outside and explore. Let's find out what you have in your corner. Let's find out the most elderly person or senior that you have in your community go and interview and do an interview what that person have to transmit you what is it so so this is a it, it isn't unlimited we we maybe have an idea but you as we engage and we are joined together in these and in, in these activities you will find out that that there are some other ways to to gather that information and that valuable knowledge the other thing is that um based on the on the, on the focus groups and meetings that we have had with different heritage experts uh, like Angus John Martin and Angus Martin and different experts from Grenada National Trust, Newton Alexander, which was us, uh, with us today. And we find out that most of the cultural element, especially the intangible ones, they are in danger of disappearing. And some of them already, already disappeared. So there's an important um, input here that we are discussing currently, but we're gonna figure it out. So this, the, beautiful, the beauty of this project is that we can come together with ideas and help us to design this. And maybe we, we, we wrote the project, but you will find new ways to, to, to solve the situation. So maybe, and it was proposed, we, we should do it in a different way, not only mention and discover what is already there, also what we do or what, we, what were you gonna do as a community to rescue the, those intelligent cultural heritage that have been lost. So I'll leave it there and we will come later and, uh, as we move forward this week. So there's, they are huge, there's a huge opportunity with this project. Uh, one we detected uh, and why we come with is that there's not an official ICH inventory list. So this is the first time that UNEDA has um, this opportunity. So we have to, in, engage and connect with the, as much as we can with the community leaders of, of all the parishes, including Caracou and Petit Martinique as well, to officially come the important outcome on one of the important outcomes, it will be the official inventory list of Grenada. So once 
we work through because this is a 16 month project and we are trained and we come together the community we we approach them we sit with them we document and we identify them the document the register manage and upload it it will be digitized and then will be officially published to everyone not only greenians uh, it will be uh, this will be part of the report and it will be a document officially uploaded and UNESCO. So um, we have this uh, wonderful opportunity as well. Um, we know that some of the intangible cultural heritage uh, elements were identified. We know that there's some initiatives around as, the, as Caracu did in, in December to, to, uh, 2019 with the Shakespeare's and mask and the boat buildings. We know that there are some initiatives, but we also have this as an opportunity that we there's some there's already happening and there's a movement of, of people and intentions happening where we realize at the same time that, it, that we have a challenge. So there's different initiatives, but in this case, we have to uh, we have to come together and have like a platform as well to communicate what other people are doing so we're not overlapping efforts and that's what's happening currently uh, so we have to come together to design a platform that's part of this project and we have to come together with this how we would do it which platform who will be managed it how will we communicate better so um Grenada cultural foundation we also have a meeting with them and they have the same concern and we are working on it and we will be working on it in this project as well. And, uh, and of course, uh, the sustainable heritage uh, education awareness, awareness uh, has a model which can be replicated, not only at national level, also at a regional level. So this is a pilot project. We hope and we know that we're gonna succeed if we work together, but once we, uh, so see, we, we implement it, and we succeed that we were able to replicate it in different communities and maybe just take one specific ICH element and apply for our fund and that will be worth it. So, and, and so we, we want to involve youth and children and most important elderly. For example, we knew for a meeting that we have from Grenada Cultural Foundation, there are elderly, elderly people or seniors dying. And uh, I went to Caracu, I love Caracu by the way. And we discovered that an elderly woman up of the 100 years old died. And so, wow, what, what, what knowledge that person uh, had and we, we lost it. And here I, we heard that there's an elderly person in St. Andrews that is 103 years. And that person, is, we have to reach them too. So children, it's important that the, the, the role that plays the, the community leaders and our team that will be working, the technicians and the ICH coordinator, has an ad, we has an idol that we gain in this, this knowledge. How will we put all these pieces together and uh, take taking advantage of, of, the, of the technology that we have, engaging and te te uh, teachers, elderly persons, uh, community uh, leaders, as well cultural organizations, cultural practitioners, and children and youth to be motivated and, and, and pick it up. Um, so I know that we will talk about this later because it's, it's, it's a lot of things to, uh, to get. So I don't, want, um, I don't want to take more time because we know that we have a very tight agenda based that we, are, uh, we have um, reduced or stressed these, uh, these workshops in, in four hours instead of six hours because we know that your time is valuable and play different roles and hats and, and job positions. So um, I'm now introducing or yes, and uh, passing the, the, the lead to, to us. Yes, before we get to Nigel, I just want to get some audience participation. Uh, because it's so important that we have an icebreaker so you can feel like you're part of this event. What I'd like you to do, maybe take about 30 seconds <laughs> as we run in short in time. Uh, Ezra, I, I believe you're on mute. Ezra? About your, your, um, your, your, your perception of intangible cultural heritage um, before is a statement what you learned from nature. 
in the past. So we, we're doing a little sort of a non-rigorous research exercise. Methodology, methodology is a little kind of, um, it's not pure, but uh, we want to make sure that to get you involved, just write three to four words, what you think in, in tangible cultural heritage is, and then you can leave it on your desk, and then later on, uh, during discussions, we can see whether or not there's any um, any uh, convergence between what you heard and what you thought. Thank you. Nigel? Thank, thank, thank you, Ezra. Hold on. Uh, sorry. All right. Uh, Okay, th thank you, Ezra. The, uh, so, so, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome, welcome again. And so as to pick up on where Ezra left off, it would be nice if you could just make a, a little jot some, some notes on what you understand to be intangible cultural heritage. And we'll, and we'll come back to that as we proceed in the course of the, of the morning. But, uh, just, I just want to pick up on something that Adriana Rojas mentioned um, with respect to the project by way of training. There are two trainings that will occur. One is happening now. And this particular training is called the workshop on implementing the 2003 convention for the safeguarding of intangible cultural heritage at the national level. So it's, we call it at UNESCO the IMP workshop and what it is it is an introduction to the convention and its components and the obligations of which there only are only a few, but certainly to drive home uh, what are the components of the convention and what the obligations are of the state for its implementation and what role communities, groups and individuals play in its implementation. So this is the first workshop. So it's a, an awareness raising uh, exercise. In that regard, you would have received uh, what is called the text of the convention. And so that is like the, uh, Daryl referenced the Bible earlier. So that is like the Bible of the, of the convention. So inside the text, you will find the articles that govern the convention and you will find the operational directives inside the convention. Most of you would have received this in, in an email. If you haven't received it as yet, uh, please bring it to Daryl and Adriana's attention, and they'll be happy to, to send it over to you. All right. Occasionally, as we proceed through the week, I'll be referencing the text of the 2003 Convention for the Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage. That is the official name. The second workshop, which will, which will occur in, in April, is a workshop where we get hands-on. And that is where we will be learning the techniques. Some of you are already practitioners of this, where we'll, we'll learn to engage our communities and to do the interviewing and the photography and the videoing that would be required to document in the, in the first instance, or to identify in the first instance, to document, and then to do what UNESCO calls create an inventory of the intangible cultural heritage of Grenada. Once that is done, and I know from what I've been told, there is the, going to be the involvement of schools, uh, very, which is an excellent approach in, in my opinion. Um, it, is, it means that you have determined that one way to transmit is to reach the youth. And indeed the youth are the ones who acquire knowledge that is transmitted from the elders and from knowledge bearers. And they, together, you with the, with the schools and the teachers and the coordinators across the three, the three major uh, islands in Grenada, you will be conducting an inventoring exercise of Grenada's uh, ICH and putting together some policy document that can be used and transferred and shared across the education system and indeed serve as a model, as Adriana said. So, so again, to reiterate, two training workshops and then a field, ex a field exercise where you will actually be engaging in the community. I want to also uh, point out that what is uh, interesting about, I know Yuri might be able to, to, to tell, tell us if that's the case, but it's an interesting experiment we're having here. Normally a workshop like this would have, would be in person and we would only have like 25 persons in, in the room. What we have now is a, a hybrid modality. We have a Zoom, Zoom feature 
So many of you are participating via Zoom. Two years ago, this would not be such a, a thing that we think of so easily, it would be such a far-fetched idea, but no, it's almost a, a part of our way of life now. Uh, the, the second modality, of course, is for the few persons who, who are in person, at the Koyaba Beach, they're sitting close by to where to where Daryl Daryl is, and then two additional features: we it's being broadcast on on Facebook. It will be rebroadcast on Facebook, and there is a YouTube channel. So there are multiple. We are we have gone full technology this time around, and so with the exception of the few the few uh, song glitches so far, so good. So it also means then that there are various modes through which you can participate. And Ezra, when we come back to Ezra here shortly, uh, Ezra will give us the, the general ways through which you will be able to participate. Occasionally, I will be engaging you uh, so as to understand, so we can all together collectively get an understanding of the situation there in Grenada. Uh, but we have in Zoom, we have the chat feature so at any point during the meeting, if you have any ideas or recommendations that you would like to make, if you're on Zoom, you can use the chat feature. Uh, on the occasions where we will be having direct discussions, there is a feature on, in Zoom, uh, there's a reactions icon at the bottom of the, of the screen. If you click on the reactions icon, you'll be able to see that you can raise your hand just as I have done just as I have done now, right? And so once you raise your hand, Ezra, who is our rapporteur, who is our moderator, who, be, who is on the ground there, he will, he will see that and then he will, ask for, he will ask for the floor, right? A second, a third way, uh, indeed once you, is the, for those who are present inside the room, you will be able to, because you are not directly sitting, you might not be sitting in front of a laptop or so, you will have the opportunity to write uh, a pencil and paper are provided there for you. And so you'll have an opportunity to pass those notes over to the moderator who will be able to share what you have said. Um, and, if, and if things are going smoothly, we might even get more creative. I know Adriana has a tablet. Uh, that we uh, we believe can rotate and be passed around the room, and we'll see if that if that works. And we'll we'll test it here shortly. We'll be testing it here in a minute. And so if that works, we'll also have that option. Certainly, the on the YouTube channel, there's a live stream there. You'll be able to comment there, and there's a Facebook page. You'll be able to comment there. And over the course of the week, we'll make every effort to acknowledge the recommendations that you'll be making the observations you'll be making and the recommendations you'll be making toward the, the future of implementing the convention in Grenada. I am so, so you can't imagine, I'm so very happy to finally to be here with you and uh, to get the, this show on the road. So for, because of familiarity, I will now ask Ezra to lead that process where we do our introductions where we each introduce ourselves, Ezra will guide us through the process of the, the introductions because we have multiple uh, participants in multiple settings. Ezra, if I can turn over to you, please, then we'll be doing the introduction of participants at this time. Ezra, I, I believe you're on mute, uh, Ezra. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you, Nigel. Yeah, Adrian is taking a tablet around so individuals can introduce themselves. Uh, one thing that Nigel said that um, with, you, with folks in Zoom land, we want to make sure that we entertain all your questions. But but we really look into themes, so your individual question may not be answered, but if it's part of, part of a theme, it will be summarized as a question. But that will happen after each component of the workshop. Go ahead. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Marlene Neptune. I am a teacher by profession. 
and I'm really excited about this um, project because it gives hope for many of the things that we've really envisioned for our people and the preservation of our culture. So I'm happy to be here and I'm happy to be re representing the Ministry of Education as well. Oh. Yeah. Working. <laughs> it's not working. Yes, you can talk. Yes, speak. Hello, good morning. Um, I'm Newton Alexander. I'm a member of the Grenada National Trust. And just to be very, very mischievous, I'm also a country boy. Thank you. <laughs> Lots of traditions. Yes. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Kim Julian. I am one of the persons representing the Ministry of Tourism. I'm the technical officer attached to the ministry, and I am looking forward to this week of um, seminar where I can learn new things um, regarding our cultural heritage and how we can preserve this going forward and how it would benefit Grenada as a whole. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Kieran Moore with Ministry of Tourism. I'm the implementation officer. And we see tangible culture everywhere. So the intangible heritage, but this intangible one is one that really makes Grenada Grenada. Persons come to Grenada and they, they see things, but the experience is what they take and enjoy the most. And many a times that is what makes their experience great. So looking forward to this. Hi, my name is Madeleine Marcel. I represent Sedu. I'm from the village of St. David's, and I'm happy to be a part of this um, workshop here today. Open to learn new things. Thank you. Hi, good morning. I'm Noel Semi from Glenville St. Andrews. I represent the St. Andrews Development Organization, Sedu. We are part of what we call Rainbow City Lang. Big Parish. I'm thrilled to be in um, this workshop and hoping to learn new things so at least we can preserve some of our heritage. Okay. Good morning. I'm Ophelia Sylvester. From Just boom it out, man. Boom it out. <laughs> Good morning. I'm Ophelia Sylvester from the Grenada National Museum. <clears throat> I'm the data collections officer, and I'm glad to be here this morning because in this institution, we've been having challenges in the preservation and the passing on of information that's tangible, but also factual about the island, the state of Grenada. So I'm glad to be here. Morning all and colleagues, friends. I am Peter Carlton Antoine. I am the executive secretary and I'm director of the Institute of People's Enlightenment. We are indeed happy to be part of this initiative. We wanna commend the, the National Trust and UNESCO for taking on this community-based project. We believe that it is very timely at this time. Um, as well, it is important that we take this opportunity to, as much as possible, build synergies. I think an important point was made with regard to the thing that there are many initiatives that have been undertaken by persons and in in, by organizations and individuals. We need the, we need the, um, the synergies and building these organizations and to cement our um, tangible heritage. Then one of the speakers made a point and I just wanted to go back to it. He mentioned that um, Carnival Monday, he um, noticed when he was uh, growing up that there were masks in the communities. And he just mentioned something I just wanted to seize on. He said, and that tradition does not exist. 
But that is not quite true because we could reproduce that tradition from his story and other stories. And that is what this project to me is about. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Good morning, everyone. I am Rachel Finney. I am an artist and a teacher. Um, I am very pleased to be here. And I think it is quite timely that this um, workshop is happening now. Recently, from my own experience in my English classes, I was quite saddened that in our um, storytelling learning for English, not a single one of my students knew a single story, a single tale that they could share with the class. And that is a um, really important intangible uh, aspect of our tradition that we need to bring back, that our children have stories that they hear from us that they can pass on and pass down because when you lose those stories, even, even the, the folk tales that might not be uh, realistic, we lose an important part of our identity. So I'm looking forward very much to this, um, this, this entire endeavor. Thank you, um, ladies and gentlemen in the audience here. Uh, I just want to go back to one thing because I, I think this will be important for, to Nigel. Um, during um, Andrea's presentation, she mentioned that youth, um, uh, you know, they're, they're not connected with a lot, a lot of the aspects of Grenadian um, heritage. And, um, and Mr. Antoine, I think, um, just, just said that, um, you know, maybe maybe I'm off the mark by saying that um, the, it's not the the whole idea about mass on Carnival Mondays, you know, walking through the communities um, is not dead because it can be reproduced. One the theme that I think that uh, Nigel, you may have to begin to uh, you know focus on a little bit is about those transmission mechanisms. You know, what are those mechanisms we're going to use to either to rekindle or to bring back alive the point Mr. Antoine was making. And um, so that now we, so that we can go to the to the um, to the um, to the um, transmission, so that it will get imbued and cemented, so it will continue. And I think that's an important piece because sometimes we overlook the obvious. The obvious in this case is the transmission mechanisms to get these things cemented back into a culture, so that we can move it, move the goalposts outward, and um, really celebrate many of the um, nice aspects of. Canadian. Okay, um, at this point, I would like the folks in Zoom land um, to introduce themselves. Uh, those who are present in Zoom land and uh, online, um, could you introduce yourselves? And by raising your hand and then we acknowledge you. Half an hour. Nothing. Yeah. Okay. Yes, we have a we have a few hands up up already. Okay, uh, I, from on my screen, I'm seeing Judy. Judy, you, could, you, could you go ahead? I'm Judy from River Sali, um, a group um, Live is Salve. We organize in. Uh, sorry, Judy. Judy, sorry, you, you're, you're muted. Could you um, un <laughs> I'm Judy from River Sally from the with the group Live A Salve organization. We are responsible for the um, River Sally Festival, those from the 16th to the 24th. We are trying to bring back all the old time traditions so that you know we would we would not lose what's what's been taught by our, our grandparents and stuff. So I am happy to be part of this session. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. I see Janelle.
Janelle, your sound is not coming through. Are, are you muted? Yeah, the Janelle, the, the sound isn't coming through. Maybe you could use the, the chat in just in case, please. And then we'll then I'll we'll come back and read that. Ma uh, thank you, Janelle. Margaret, snap. Okay. Okay, my name is Maria Davies. I'm the president of the Willie Red Hat Foundation. Culture has been an issue with me from very early childhood on. Uh, though I'm not a born Grenadian, I've been coming to Grenada since 1968, and some things, traditions, I actually experienced. Uh, the intangible cultural heritage is what defines a nation. To not save it means to lose our identity, so I'm very pleased to be able to participate in this. The Willie Redhead Foundation has focused more on the built heritage although we're not exclusively involved in that. We also have a program going with one of the schools. So this is definitely something that I'm very excited about. Thank you for including me. Welcome, Maria. Uh, Margaret? Here I am. Good morning, everyone. My name is Margaret Snag, and I live on Kariakou. It is uh, Providence, I suppose I should say, that I'm, I'm here with you and we're having this conversation. I, I'm not as knowledgeable as our leadership, but I am a sophomore with ICH, so I'm delighted to be involved. Um, I live in Six Roads, and the irony is, and why I say it's Providence, is the house where I'm staying is traditionally in my village where Shakespeare moss costumes were put together and made right here in my village. So I'm just so excited to meet everyone um, and look forward to working with you. Welcome, Margaret. Thank you. Dion Legard. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, I am Dion Legard and I'm from Karku, and I am more than excited and happy to be a part of um, this community-based project, uh, part of my heritage. And indeed, I am proud of being a Grenadian, and I'm I'm very happy that that you know we we decided to take on this this project because I feel like um I feel like it is important that we preserve um our heritage and our culture and everything that makes us unique. You know. So I'm just speaking on behalf of um, myself and I guess all the other youths of Haraku. Um, we are happy to be a part of this uh, endeavor. Thank you. Welcome, Dion from Karaku. Let's go over to Tahiria Vaitwin. Please uh, help me if I say your name. In <laughs> Good morning, it's Vivega. V, 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 yes, it's v, not v, pronounced. Yes, it's like not German, pronounced. It's, it's like German, right? It's yes, it's German. Okay. Never, um, Dutch Netherlands, I think Netherlands, Dutch uh, Netherlands to be a, yeah. All right, got you, got you. All right, good morning, everybody. My name is Tahira Viveg. I am a teacher by profession. Um, so the founder and artistic director of Spiceland Dancers. I've been involved in culture for as long as I know. And I think that's a great initiative, especially to try to get um, culture within the schools, because most of the children now have no idea about the origin of short or jab, but especially our traditional mass. So there's nothing documented that we as teachers can teach within, within the school system. And I think this is a great initiative, especially to bring it in the school, which would continue to keep our tradition and our mass alive. So I'm very proud to be part of this session. Thank you. Thank you, Tahira. Let's go to Friedel Logi. 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 All right. Good morning. My name is Friedel Logi. I'm a teacher with the St. George's Institute. I'm very happy to be here because I am a history teacher. 
and trying to keep Grenada's culture alive has been one of my pet projects ever since I've been teaching 18 years. It's something I've been doing since day one. So I'm extremely happy to be here and thank you for the opportunity. All right, welcome Friedel. Friedel, are you in a plane by any chance? Are you? No, no, I just have that yeah. background to remind yeah. me to always keep flying. Yeah, you get, nice, nice, nice. All right, let's go over to Natisha Ruiz. Natisha Natisha Ruiz. Hi, good morning. My name is Natisha Ruiz. I'm part of the River Sally, like the Live Sally group in River Sally St. Patrick's. I'm also a member of the St. Patrick's Organization for Development. And it's a great pleasure being on this platform to learn more about our heritage and my youth as well. So it will give me great pleasure to learn more. And also with what the lady was saying this morning, we also have in St. Patrick's uh, lady that is 105. We give me great pleasure to say we have one that is 105. And it will be a pleasure to learn whatever it is we have to learn on this platform. Thank you. Thank you, Natisha. Gloria Bonaparte or Bonaparte? Bonaparte. Good morning, everyone. Bonaparte. Right. I am a, uh, an educator, have been an educator on my life. In fact, 40 plus years, I have um, devoted my life to educating persons. Currently, I am assisting with the documentation and looking forward to enhance what it is that we're doing to make sure that this is sustained, this, this idea of documenting all of these and transmitting it to the relevant persons um, is sustained. I, I could quickly remember now that we no longer play marbles with buttons and marbles on the ground. I don't see that anymore. And there's just so many things that's, that, that needs to come back that I am happy to be part of this and I'll do my best based on what I, I think is within my capacity. Thank you. Welcome, Gloria. Thank you. Let's go to Dario Sandrini. Yes, can you hear me? You can hear me. Hi, good morning to you all from Cariacu, Dario Sandrini and um, Kido Foundation. I think uh, we had met uh, Mr. Dario Breathitt before we even knew that we would go to live in Cariacu for 32 years. So thank you, Daryl, for your friendship. Um, yes, uh, Kido Foundation has actually, uh, at least we can say, of course, we are not natives, but we are Grenadian citizens. And uh, in 1994, uh, together with an ethnobotanist, we collected from 130 elderly in Cariacu, the ethnobotanical records of medical plants used in traditional karyaku. It's how people used to heal each other in the community. And of course, sadly, most of them have disappeared now, even people who are younger than myself. But uh, the record is here. It's already, it's been in the hands of several karyakuans who are working on it in order to make a book. So this is also one of the ideas. The second one of what Kido uh, has done in 2013, kids with cameras. Lots of students from different schools got a camera, which again, uh, Mr. Brathit helped uh, get together. And they have been taking photographs of monuments, of Tibo Cemetery, of, uh, of trees, of plants, of nature in Kariaku. And they went to places to take pictures which are unique because they had new eyes to see new things. Now, the, one of these youths told me one very strong question. When I showed him in Ansela Roche, the ruins, the canon, history, he turned to me and said, he's now taller than me, he was just 14 or 13. He said, Mr. Dario, where are the tombs of the slaves? 
I could not let that one pass. And I promised him that if he's serious, we will endeavor to go into that history and dig out the truth and find out where. Let's into the real history. So this is uh, our keto moves. Thank you. Thank you, Dario. Very informative. Let's go to Brenda Hood. Good morning, and uh, I'm so pleased to be listening to this program. As I said, my name is Brenda Hood. I was a former Minister of Tourism and Culture, and I'm very pleased that we are at this point in our cultural development, and I'm happy to hear of the program and what has been held. Minister, I am uh, the, uh, also the advisor to the Minister of Tourism, who could not join us this morning because she's at Cabinet. But I want to assure you that the Ministry of Tourism, and I noticed there are two participants there who are very committed. I haven't heard from culture yet, and but I'm certain they're on. And also in terms of education, I think it's critical to have the teachers involved. And I really, really hope that this will grow from strength to strength. I must commend Mr. Brathwit. I know he has been working tirelessly over the years. We have worked together in the past. And I'm confident that this will become a reality. Thank you so much. Welcome, Brenda. Welcome, Tourism. We go over to Kiri Ann John Williams. Pearl Ann. Thank you. Morning, everybody. Can you hear me? OK. So yes, my name is Kirl Ann John Williams, and I I'm originally from St. Patrick's, Grenada. I am now in Seattle, Washington, but hoping to come back to Grenada quite soon. And um, I've always had an interest in our culture and I'm troubled by the fact that we seem to keep losing parts of it. So I'm very, very passionate about um, what is about to happen today. And um, I am <clears throat> so much so that I started a YouTube channel to document culture as a whole. And um, the name of it is One One Coco. You can check it out. But in it, I started, you know, just documenting things about our culture. And something I'm very passionate about is um, our patwa. I don't know if that one could come back, but um, I'm very, very happy to be part of this grouping. And I hope we're all in it for the long term. So welcome, everybody. I'm good to be here. Thank you, Caroline, and welcome. Uh, let's go to Kelvin Jacob. Hi, good morning, everyone. I am Kelvin Jacob, and I am the CEO of Spice Mass Cooperation. And I'm very happy to be here this morning, especially hearing talks about the traditional aspect of our culture directly related to Carnival. So I'm really looking forward to this workshop and this training so that we can add some more value to our carnival as it relates to our traditional mass. Thank you. All right, thank you, Kelvin, and welcome. Let's go to Kerlin. Kerlin, if you're there. Hello? 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 Yes, we can hear you now. Oh, you can, right. Yes, good morning. Uh, my name is Colin Campbell. I am a journalist and I'm also really interested in um, getting into you know, this conversation about um, preserving our intangible cultural heritage. All right, thank you, Colonel, and welcome to the media. Let's go to Kirk Philip. Kirk, Philip. Good morning. I'm Kirk Philip, representing the Ministry of Culture, Division of Culture, sorry. And I'm happy to be in here this morning. Thank you, Kirk, and welcome to Culture. Um, also, there are other persons that are attending, but they does not have mic on their device, or they are listening. I think they, they sent message in the chat that they are on. 
Okay, I'll be reading that here in a second, Kirk. Thank you very much for that. All right. Thank you. Thank let's you. Go, let's do. Uh, have we heard from Shane? Hey, you mean? Hello. Y yes, Shane. We can hear you. Uh, uh, morning, um, Shane McEwen from Gov, representing the Gov Improvement Committee, committee responsible for the 29 June festivities. Thank you. Uh, could you repeat that one more time, Shane? What um, festivity? The Gov Improvement Committee. That's a committee solely responsible for the 29 June festival. 29 June Fisherman's Birthday. Okay. Thank you very much. Let's go over to um, Anisha Benjamin. Anisha Benjamin. Good morning, everyone. Everybody's hearing me. Yes, ma'am. Um, my name is Anisha Benjamin, and I am representing the Virgin Parish Cultural Organization in St. David. And I am very happy to be a part of this great initiative. Thank you very much. Welcome, Anisha. Let's go over to, I'm seeing Abe Meyer or I.B. Meyer. That's Ib Meyer. Ib Meyer. He sounds like the mayor. Ib Meyer. All right. Yes, you can unmute now, Ib. He's a principal of our Grace Lutheran School. Ib. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not hearing you. I think you have to unmute. Okay, I, I have my microphone working now. My name is Eve Meyer. I'm the pastor and principal of Grace Lutheran School. Um, I, I put a note there that uh, ICH is just national knowledge. It's our, it's my privilege to work, to to gather and transmit national knowledge. So blessings to you all. Thank you, Ib. And thank you for partnering with this project. Alana George. Um, good morning, I'm Alana George and I'm representing the Division of Youth. Welcome youth, welcome Alana. Adriana McLeod. Or Andrea, I should say. Yeah, Sorry. Good morning, everybody. Andrea McLeod. Um, I teach art and design at the TA Marishaw Community College. I've worked with um, the Grenada National Trust before with um, through the OAS project that Adriana uh, mentioned. So I'm really excited to be involved in this UNESCO um, partnership because I know there's a lot of hidden gems that we're going to be able to unearth. Um, so it's nice to be here and to see everybody involved. Welcome, Andrea. Thank you. Uh, Sa Sanil, Sanil. Sai Sanil, I hope I'm saying it correctly. Um, the Sanil person, is, this is one of the person representing from culture and they do not have a um, microphone. Okay, sure, no problem, thank you. Welcome Also, Sanil. Also the, ne the next person is um, Zinari. Mm -hmm. Yeah, do not have a microphone. Okay, thank you. Oh, all right, welcome guys. Thank you for being here. Angus Martin. Sorry. 
to do to do to do hello everyone um angus um i am a grenadian uh, historian archivist um really looking forward to this uh, i think it's absolutely necessary that we do this and start this at this time to get a good record of our cultural heritage um so really looking forward to getting this training and seeing people go out in the field and collect this information that's vitally important um and hopefully this is also the training for the tangible cultural heritage which also needs to be done so um so yeah um can't wait to see this this happen uh welcome angus good to see you again let's go to Akarda Ventura. Akarda Ventura. Akarda Ventura. I, I see perhaps uh, I see that Akarda has written in the chat uh, St. Andrew's Development Organization. If you're unable to to unmute yourself or to speak, Akarda, welcome. Let's go to GE. GE. Welcome to, to you, GE, if you're, if you're hearing me. And Jay Sean Clark, if you can go over to Jay Sean Clark. Or Jashan Clark. Okay. We're not getting, uh, if we can try Tesfa Peterson. Welcome to you, Jashan, if you can hear me. Tesfa Peterson. Hello, my name is Tesfa Peterson. I am a PhD researcher from Chantemel in Grenada, uh, currently doing research in Canada. And this uh, project is very much aligned to my research interests. I'm also the assistant to the executive secretary of the Institute for People's Enlightenment, who is attending in person. And I'm really happy to be a part of this initiative and to, to see it, as Angus said, flourish and to be taken out into our communities. I think it's absolutely vital to our national patrimony that we um, we do this kind of work. So thank you for having me. Thank you for being here, Tesfa, and welcome. D de 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 Coteau. D de Coteau. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Delicia de Coteau. I am the de senior Coteau. technical officer in the Ministry of Tourism, and I'm also happy to be here today. Okay, welcome, welcome. Sports, you see sports is here. That would be youth and sports. Youth mm -hmm. and sports, the ministry of, the division of, excellent. Are you, are you, are you there? Welcome to, to you then, in any case, thank you for being here. Alison Carvel Lett. Good morning, I'm Alison Cavalet and I am the program coordinator at the Division of Culture. I look forward to learning more about the intangible cultural heritage. And we're so happy that you've invited us to be part of this workshop. Thank you so much. Welcome, Alison. Happy to have you. And then Judy Antoine. I am Judy Antoine. Antoine. I am from Chantemel, St. Patrick. I am a director of a, what started off as a children's performing group called Ashanti Footprints. We do drumming, singing, dancing, stilt work, costume making. And I would say that now our group is intergenerational. Mm. And um, intangible cultural heritage is a part of what we do. And so I look forward to ways in which I can contribute and also ways in which I can learn and grow on So 
my organization. Excellent, Judy. Thank you for being here. Let's go to Mina Booker. Mina Booker or Mina Booker. Okay. Uh, if you're if you're able to hear me, Mina, welcome. Let's do. Uh, I'm seeing Oliver Benoit or or Ben Ben White. Yes, uh, Oliver Benoit, uh, professor of sociology. I'm also an artist, and an area of my research is also heritage and national identity. Welcome, Oliver. Thank you. Annika Edwards. Okay. And uh, hey, good morning. Hi, Annika. Hi, I'm Annika Edwards from Grenada. Um, I am fascinated and interested in culture. Um, I believe it is something that shares our heritage and where we come from. I'm looking forward to this um, workshop, this initiative, and I congratulate my UNESCO for such an initiative, keeping us alert and informed. Thank you very much. So I just look for a fun feel and great learning experience with all my counterparts. Welcome, welcome, Annika. Good to have you here. And I see, is there anyone who we might have missed? I see Jason, Jason Clark, I, uh, CARICOM Youth Ambassador. I know that uh, I see it in the chat. Welcome to, welcome to Jashan Clark. I know that the CARICOM Youth Ambassador is an excellent regional initiative. So congratulations to you for having that, that particular post and responsibility. Uh, Judy, we see Anisha, Kirk, uh, Admire, Ricardo Ventura, Adriana. All right, I think we, did, if we missed anyone, please uh, write your name in the chat and then we'll, we'll get to, to you later. Good morning, good morning. Yes. Good morning. Uh, David Anthony Hopkins. Okay, Anthony. Um, representing the Guav Improvement Committee, mm -hmm. as well as a core author of the documentation that Gloria Bonaparte spoke about, documenting our culture and heritage, and a policy development officer in the Cabinet Office of Grenada. Um, I'm very much excited about this workshop, particularly um, linking our modern times with our past. And um, many times we focus on the things that we can see, but we forget those intangibles, those things that make us who we are, understanding where we come from and why we express ourselves in such ways now. So I look forward to the experience. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony, and, and welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to, to you all. Uh, we are slightly behind schedule, but not to worry, there are ways to to which we can we can make up for time. It's more important that we get to know each other. It is, in fact, the 2003 convention is a people's convention. I like to, to think of it and describe it in that way. It is a convention where the culture and the living heritage live among and with the people. And so it's important that we get to, to know each other and be able to participate in, in that spirit. I'm seeing here Nadina, Williams. Nadina Williams is the guidance and counseling officer for primary schools in Kariakou and Petit Martinique in District 1. And then Jody Ann Sylvester, uh, the Grenada National Museum. All right. So let me just, uh, before we, we're going to take a, a short break here so we can reset ourselves. Can you, can you see a, a screen that has a timetable on it? Yes. All set. All 
Hi, hi again, everybody. Uh, welcome back. So indeed, what we, we are attempting to do is to cover about six and a half hours of material in, in about four hours. Uh, and uh, so um, we'll be moving through this process. Uh, Ezra will function as the can, can you hear me? Oh, yes, sorry, I can see. So Ezra will function as the moderator. So what we'll, we'll attempt, what we'll, uh, the format we have we agreed on is that as we go through the, the various units, which I will share with you shortly, we will allocate the, the, the final five to seven minutes of each segment for questions, discussions, recommendations. Uh, those can be put in the chat uh, in, this, in Zoom. Or if you're in there in uh, present at Oyaba, you can write the, the questions, comments, or recommendations on a piece of paper and pass it off to, to Ezra. I think there's a third option which I saw work just now where there's a roving uh, tablet where if you wish to speak, you may request the tablet and, and that, will, that will be shared with you. Ezra, because I, he has eyes on the ground, Ezra will be moderating that. So he will, at any point we, there is a need to share, he will be uh, bringing it, he'll be pausing and bringing it to my attention so that we might share what is being, what is being said, okay? So um, can you see the uh, PowerPoint which says introduction to the workshop on your screen? Margaret, I see you shaking your head. You're, you're the only person like, okay, thank you, Margaret. Okay, thank you. So if we might proceed then, I will just uh, provide an overview of the, the workshop itself. Uh, the, this map, this open source map that I found on, on the internet was as close as I could get to, to, to Grenada. But, uh, and I, now I have a, at least an aerial graphic visual of the three main islands. And I see you have smaller, number of smaller islands there, uh, Cariacou, uh, Petit, Martinique, and uh, Grenada, which seems to be the, the islands which uh, have uh, large residences, no? And I see representation from all, from all three, as far as I can tell. So welcome to, to everyone there. So about this workshop, it is a, the project itself is entitled Proud of My, my Heritage. Uh, this is workshop number one. It is entitled The Workshop on Implementing the 2003 Convention for the Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage at the national level. This workshop is designed for five days at four hours per day, starting at 8.30 your time and ending at 12.30 your time, just in time for, for lunch. In between, you will have uh, two 15-minute breaks. Uh, that is the plan. For those of you at Poyaba, you'll be receiving uh, some snacks and coffee. For those of us in other places, we can go into our kitchens and, and, some, uh, and go grab what's what's available. No, so um, so Daryl, you owe us some coffee next time around. <laughs> but the modes, the modes of delivery. Uh, there, there are two primary modes here. We talked about the Zoom, which most uh, many of you are already logged on and we're not having any problems there as yet, or hopefully we don't. Then we have in person, which are at the Koyab, and then we have a YouTube live stream and a Facebook live stream. Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Daryl, but is, is the Facebook live stream going on now? Or will it be posted later? No, no, no. It's on both on, on Facebook and on um, YouTube. Live beautiful. streaming. Beautiful, beautiful. So we are we're out there in the wide world wide web. So so we are out there in the world wide web and uh, persons we will we have a, a system in place where we're monitoring comments and recommendations as they come in from those various sources. So truly a, a hybrid experience here for us. Uh, the timetable of work is as follows. There are five days. On day one, we'll be looking at an introduction to the convention itself, an introduction to the workshop, an overview. Uh, very shortly, we'll be doing uh, the convention itself in unit two, 
and key concepts of, of the convention. So this is the to start our, our week of, of uh, discourse and awareness raising. On day two, we begin to look at the concept, the overall concept of implementing the convention and in units four, five, and six. We look at the question, who can do what in implementing the convention? Uh, you know that the convention, there are various actors, the state has a role, communities, groups, and individuals have roles, practitioners, knowledge bearers have roles, teachers have roles, community organizers have roles. Because it's living heritage, there's a role for everyone. Uh, in unit five, we look at why and how to raise awareness about ICH. And then in unit six, we'll be looking at identification and inventoring of ICH. This will be an in, uh, number six is a unit six is an introductory segment because the second workshop will will all be dealing will all be dealing in more detail with this process of identification and inventory, which is one of, by the way, is one of the obligations of the one of the few obligations of the convention. But I'll come back to that shortly. Day three. Again, with implementing the convention, units seven, eight, and nine, we'll be looking at involving the communities concerned with implementing ICH and sustainable development. Ezra spoke about that question of sustainability. Uh, uh, we have persons here from tourism, education, and so on, who all have roles to play here. And we'll be discussing that and seeing how we can begin to, 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 to bring into focus ICH and sustainable development in the Grenada context. We'll be looking at safeguarding. There are various ways to safeguard. Again, the question was posed earlier about what are some of the ways, I think it was Ezra again, the question of transmission, right? Transmission is one mode of safeguarding. We'll be looking at all the ways through which safeguarding can happen. And certainly we'll be looking to hear ideas from you about how ICH might be safeguarded in, in Grenada and, and elsewhere. On day four, Again, with implementing the convention, we'll be looking at the concept of ICH policies and institutions. With respect to implementing the convention, some states might wish to pursue from a policy perspective and institutional perspective uh, ways to safeguard so that the broader state is, a, a, the broader state is uh, actively engaged so that uh, communities, uh, community NGOs or so on are actively engaged uh, when we say institutions, we uh, there's a, a good example from you right now, from what I could tell, in addition to the tourism and the youth and sports and education and culture, uh, uh, a good institution is always the education system, schools. And so uh, I think you have excellent representation from the number of persons that and we've seen here. Unit 11, we look at the concept of nomination. So once the state goes through its process of uh, inventoring and so on, the state might wish to have certain elements, as it's called, elements of its cultural heritage, living cultural heritage, recognized at the international level. And so the state would then endeavor to nominate one of those or more elements for inscription at the international level. We'll be looking at that, so international recognition and awareness uh, with respect to that element belonging to, uh, sorry, from Grenada. In unit 12, we'll be looking at international cooperation and assistance. Interestingly enough, the Grenada National Trust have already, as a, have already, they started in terms of implementing, started with this concept of international assistance. So the process that they undertook in itself to apply for funding uh, is part of what is called the International Assistance Program. And uh, they have successfully done so to bring us to where we are now. On day five, we'll be winding down and we'll be getting ready for the second workshop, which comes up in April. Now, one of the activities we'll be doing is to, as a matter of fact, if you can begin to put on your thinking hats right now, as Ezra had mentioned to and asked earlier in the, in the morning, uh, what is living heritage? What is your understanding of it? But I'd like to add something to that. If you can think of what would be the living heritage elements or the ICH elements in Grenada, right? Uh, we've heard things like boat building. We've heard things like Shakespeare's mask. We've heard things like Indians and, and carnival and so on. 
But if you can begin to really reflect on the corners and, and wider society, and uh, we'll attempt to put together a list of what those might be for Friday. And that will be the starting point for our work in identification and inventory. So please uh, think about that as, as we proceed through the, the week. Uh, in unit 13, we'll be looking at the Intangible Heritage Convention. This is the, the 2003 convention that we're looking at right now. It's called the Intangible Heritage Convention or the Formal name is the 2003 Convention for the Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage and the World Heritage Convention. The World Heritage Convention is the more popular convention uh, because it deals with the tangible assets of, of countries and so on. So they, in the Caribbean, you'd see maybe a Port Royal, you'd see uh, in St. Kitts, Brimstone Hill. I know uh, Daryl mentioned that you have fort, uh, a fort there as well and some discussion about it being a World Heritage Convention. But we'll look at the, the, the distinction between the two conventions and discuss it in more detail and uh, why, why the conventions are set up in this way. And then of course, <clears throat> to come to, to bring the workshop to a close, Adriana and Daryl will once again break, take us through the Proud of My Heritage project in more detail and set us up for what is to happen in the coming 16, in the 16 months, uh, during which time this project will be implemented. And then we'll conclude the workshop uh, in, unit, in unit 14. So again, in terms of participating in the workshop, Ezra, please give me the signal uh, if I'm correct here. Again, the Zoom feature in the chat. The, uh, tablet will be circulated. We'll experiment with that to see how well that continues to work. Uh, uh, folks can also pass you notes, which you will take a note of. Ezra has an important function in the week in that he will be uh, summarizing key concepts and so on, and we will be relaying, we'll be relaying those uh, back to you so that we are able to think uh, in a more focused way, many of the things that we would have uh, discussed during the course of the of the week. But so before we proceed then to our next uh, unit, um, let me just once again show you the timetable. Sorry, one second. So this is what the, the units look like. Uh, are you seeing the, the timetable? Yes. Okay. All right. So this is what the, the units look like in terms of the, the timetable. We'll try to make it uh, uh, very concise. Uh, you'll see we go, they're, they're organized in one hour, one hour blocks. Uh, we, it doesn't necessarily mean that we and you, we might use the, all, one, the, the, the whole hour, but certainly um, we can, because we are, we're intending to try and condense the, the content into these shorter, shorter blocks. But certainly one of the things we want to do is to remain, for you to remain engaged. So you'll see the Tuesday schedule, units four, five, and six. On, so you, each day you have three units, Wednesday, seven, eight, and nine, Thursday, 10, 11, 12, and Friday 13 and 14. Now, if you notice each day we start off like we, with some activity. And so for tomorrow, we, the, tomorrow's activity will be a recap of day one. So uh, I'm looking for a, a volunteer. If someone would be willing to volunteer just to, to take some notes of the main uh, points that we'll be covering in the next two units. I, I would appreciate that. And then all you have to do in the morning is just to take us through what were some of the main points from, from the day's discussions. Now, the, you will have an assistant. Ezra is, is the in-house moderator and assistant. And so you'll find that during the course of uh, each, at the end of each unit, he will interrupt and say, Nigel, we have five minutes remaining and we want to hear from, from the, from, from the attendees. And so he would interrupt and then he will make a few summary points based on what you're putting in the chat or asking in terms of questions or recommendations you're making. 
So that will also be a, a way through which you can compile some of the, the main points. So is there, can I ask for a volunteer for today, please? Where? Any volunteers? <laughs> Everyone's looking at each other. Well, well uh, I might, I'm, I'm, hey, Nigel? Hey, Nigel. Yes, sir. I, I may have to um, select, I will select somebody. Okay, you know, okay. Uh, I'm gonna put on a teacher hat and select somebody. All right, all right, good, 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 good. I, I know you can see the, the, the faces who are willing just to volunteer. Go around right, the room right and then I'll just, you know. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna come 10 faces and then wherever you can <laughs> Excellent, excellent. The teacher is moving around the room. Everyone's trying to avoid the teacher. Not to be here. Well, then, then, okay, I'll deputize Marlene for that. Marlene okay. will be the, um, the volunteer. Marlene's last name? Just, yes. Uh, what, we have a volunteer, that? Nigel. <laughs> okay, Marlene, thank you. Based on your definition, Nigel, we have a volunteer. <laughs> all right, all right. Thank you. Reminds me of, uh, you know, school days. Please, please, teacher, don't call me. Don't call me. Okay, nobody wants a teacher to see them. Especially if it's a, it's a difficult math problem, no? All right, thank you then. So we can proceed. Yes. So we're getting now to the, to the convention itself. So we'll be looking now in this presentation at the UNESCO and its conventions, uh, and then the Intangible Cultural Heritage Convention itself, purposes of the convention, organs of the convention, two lists and a register, which make up the 2003 convention, the operational directives, the ICH fund, the obligations and benefits. Now, this is just a summary of what you already have in terms of the text of the convention, all right? So what I would advise you to do in order to bring yourself into the, the expert domain yourself, you just make it light reading, you know? You, you take that text, you print it if you prefer hard copy, you, you, or if you prefer reading on your tablets or computer, and you just go through and read the convention itself so you can begin to uh, internalize it. Because even though I will go through it now, uh, it will probably require some further reading on your part in order to fully understand what is required. And the reason I'm emphasizing that is because this is truly a people's convention. In many ways, the impetus for the state to act with implementing the convention will come from you, the communities the individuals within the society who are the owners, the knowledge bearers and practitioners of particular ICH, it will come from the NGOs. You will, you will have to actively yes. Yes. say to the, the, the national leaders that this is something that you would like to, to pursue and do and to seek their support. And if it's through, there are many ways to do it because you know states have different mechanisms, but in terms of this convention, the better, the more familiar you are with it, it'll provide you with one of the paths or one of the ways through which you can, you can, you can work towards safeguarding uh, the convention in, in Grenada. So in terms of UNESCO and its uh, conventions, uh, there's an intergovernmental organization. I'm sorry, I, I hate to jump in. Someone's sure. microphone is open and I'm catching you twice. Okay. Yeah, could, could you mute? Yeah. Is it better now, Margaret? Okay, thank you. <laughs> I had muted myself, yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All, right, good. All right, so the-, oh, the... Also, Nigel, just let me add um, that the slides will be, the presentation will be circulated by email after. So those of you who don't want to um, take notes right now, but you're just distracting you from listening, um, you can be assured that you will get the, 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 the slides later. Yes, 
at the end of the day. Okay. Yeah. So the, yeah, these will come to you at the end of the day. Thank you, Daryl. So the UNESCO uh, is comprised of a, it's an intergovernmental organization of 195 member states. And UNESCO itself deals with, with five sectors, education, natural sciences, social sciences, human sciences, culture, communication, and information. There's still feedback, right? No, still no. Some... Is it still there now? Oops. Uh, I see, I think Janelle, could, I, I'm only seeing, could you just mute yourselves, please, just for the time being? And then uh, if you'd like to, to say something, you, you use the reaction button where you can raise your hand, please. Just, just as a reminder, I know it's not deliberate, but it's just the, the feedback that it's causing. Mm -hmm. And so there are seven UNESCO conventions in the fields of, of culture and heritage, and uh, they deal with tangible, intangible and natural heritage. Um, they deal with the diversity of cultural expressions, and there's one that deals with the issue of copyright, which you know is very is very important. And the the region on a whole is um, a little bit behind on this area, no? But we're not we we'll, we won't delve into it much, but just to bring an awareness about it. The three related UNESCO conventions on culture and heritage are, namely, the Convention concerning the protection of world cultural and natural heritage. So. Uh, for short, they call this the World Heritage Convention. In, in the region, you would have um, uh, Port Royal, Brimstone Hill, the, the Barrier Reef uh, system in, in Belize, the Convention for the Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage, which is the convention that we'll be looking at. And then there is the 2005 Convention on the Protection and Promotion of the Diversity of Cultural Expressions. That particular convention uh, is a more recent one, as you can tell, but it it's more targeting the creative and the creative and cultural industries no? uh, related to culture. So you see that UNESCO makes a distinction here. The World Heritage Convention of 72 deals with tangible. The convention of 2003 deals with the intangible and the the Convention of 2005, Diversity of Cultural Expressions, deals with the economic, the creative uh, side of the of culture. So you see an attempt to, to specialize and to particularly to, to safeguard, promote, and to create opportunities across the three conventions. So if we were to compare the World Heritage Convention and the Intangible Heritage Convention, World Heritage is tangible and the 2003 is intangible. The World Heritage Convention of 72 is for the conservation of world heritage properties. You see the term properties there. So it, it puts you in a, physical, usual, in a physical space, cultural and or natural. So you have natural heritage sites like the, like the Barrier Reef and, and, and different, uh, different natural landscapes and spaces. They have what is called outstanding universal, universal value. It's important to the humanity for one reason or the other. Um, the, you know, like take, take for example, the, the natural landscapes of the, the barrier reefs and, and the importance to fish stocks and uh, underwater, underwater heritage, right? There is the issue, it, it's concerned with authenticity and integrity, which help to define the value often restricting change. So once you have an element inscribed in the world, under the World Heritage Convention, there are limitations about what you can do. So you can't take a fort for argument's sake and, and rebuild it uh, as you have a mind, because that would be, that would be uh, taking away from its authentic, uh, its authentic self, right? It would change the dynamics, the dynamics of it. So if you think of uh, the pyramids of Egypt, if you were to, Somebody were to decide that they want to build a, a skyscraper there. For argument's sake, that's a that's a no no, right? Or the the Maya temples in, in Mexico and Belize and Central America, right? Or or the ancient cities in in Timbuktu and so on. Those those play, those are things that under the World Heritage Convention, that's a no no. In terms of the 2003 Convention, now 
It is concerned with safeguarding of all intangible cultural heritage, expression, skills, and practices, and knowledge. We'll be getting into definition shortly. Um, uh, Ezra, could you, could you, from the chat, uh, I noticed some persons, based on your request, had made some comments about what they understand intangible cultural heritage to mean. Could you revisit those, please, and see and read a few of those to see where people are coming from there? Yeah, I'm going to give you one from the audience first. One of our colleagues that's here live with us uh, says that ICH deals with stories, folklore, cultural expressions such as dance, songs, art, acting. And from, a com from the community level, ICH deals with festivals and family uh, norms and customs. So I imagine the family part might be the cuisine um, and practices in a home. Like for example, we, um, when I was a little boy in a home on Fridays, uh, certain nights I, we say about five or six prayers. I, I, you know, we just repeat them. I just did it because, you know, it was a practice in the family. So that's um, when it's all about family norms and customs. Uh, we have another one, um, ICH, uh, spiritual beliefs, religious practices, just mentioned that, Patois language, um, folklore, tales of Jumbi, door openers, Le Garou. Uh, by the way, I saw in Montreal in, in a, a restaurant, um, the name, they had a fox, uh, not a, a wolf, I think Le Garou in French um, means wolf, but um, werewolf, there, there's a werewolf with the word Ligaru, and I, it's the first time I've seen Ligaru written in real life, the word written, you know, I just used to say it, you know, and hear it, but I saw it in real life written. Uh, generational customs, Christmas traditions, and carnival practices. And from the standpoint of um, experiences, learning to cook local dishes, food, and make drinks. And, you know, I was just thinking about Conkey, you know, I, I, I'm separated from Grenada, culture for about 45 years. So I'm basically, everything I say today um, is about stuff 45 years ago. So I, when I say conky, I'm, uh, maybe it's still around, but I don't know. But conky is something I, I used to eat when I was, I was a kid, you know? So um, those are some of the experiences. Um, in the chat itself, um, we have colleagues saying that uh, ICH speaks to the practices, expression, skills, knowledge, means and ways that is recognized as a way of life for people, their cultural marks or way of life. ICH uh, cannot be physically felt, but a part of what makes us who we are. Social practices, knowledge of making craft, uh, festive events and so on. Um, the, the moral cultural traditions or capital of uh, communities in regard to practices, memories, experiences of a people that represents us. I think based on the samples I just gave, it's not a ram random sample, but it's kind of an arbitrary with the numbers that we have. Um, I think basically on point. So the next step now, now that we have actually stated what these, um, what, what ICH is all about, now it's about, um, uh, we have the awareness, now it's about building the capacity so you can go about uh, inventorying um, these um, um, symbols and icons and so on. And then the next step will be to um, transmit it, but also safeguarding them. Because there's a lot of those practices that are slowly moving away because the youth, as Andriana said, uh, no longer um, focusing on that. If you do a survey of youth today, many of what we are talking about, they will never be able to even discuss it or take it off the drawing board, give it legs in terms of um, articulation of what those practices mean and how they contributed to our development as a country. So we have a big task ahead of us. The enthusiasm is there, I can tell. Um, the desire is there. Now it's about getting the capacity so you can go out and um, enumerate ways to safeguard, curate, and also to transmit. So I think we, 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 we solved one of the problems so far, um, which is the awareness is there. 
So let's move to um, the skill building uh, so we can have the capacity to go about and um, collect the data. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Ezra. So we, we see that, uh, that we have a, a pretty good understanding of what we mean when we talk about uh, expression, skills, practices, and knowledge. But when we think of these things, too, we're talking about the cultural or social dimensions. So it involves people. And it's people that is uh, at the center of keeping these uh, traditions <clears throat> and these ways of living and being alive. Someone, uh, the best description I heard uh, in terms of layman's terms with respect to, to, to ICH is that everything we do from the time we wake up in the morning until we go to sleep at night, and sometimes including our dreams. Because even our dreams, I don't know if you, globally, you have dream books and all these sorts of things. People have dreams and they think it to mean uh, one thing or the other, you know? Some people dream of their parents and it will have meaning. Some people will dream of particular scenarios and they'll attach it to numbers, they'll, you know? And so even, even our dreams can constitute, in fact, uh, intangible cultural heritage. How, for example, how you interpret dreams. You might only know how to interpret it based on what you've heard your parents or the elders, the elders, the elders say, right? And so um, even in our dreams. So communities, however, define the value that's attached to any ICH element. And so now I'm introducing the term element. When we talk about any aspect of ICH, the, uh, we refer to it in terms of the convention, we refer to it as an element, an element of ICH. And the communities define the value. Ezra, you said just now, for example, that you, you, you prayed six times, or right? And you don't know why you're praying, but there was a value that you didn't quite understand that your parents saw. And the, the value may have well been to, to teach humility. The value may have been to, to teach, uh, uh, to, to be opti uh, teaching optimism to teach family togetherness, uh, family cohesiveness. So there, there's a, but the communities concern define the value. So what that means then uh, from the perspective of those of us who are on the outside looking in, we should never attempt to impose our value on someone else's ICH. That value is defined by the persons who are the practitioners and bearers. And that is something critical to understand. And then finally here, ICH changes over time. Unfortunately, uh, well, well, I think it, it's, a, it's, for, it's, a, it's fortune, you could say, because it's very difficult. It's not, like tangi it's not like tangible world heritage, like a building. People change, circumstances change. And so sometimes we, we have the idea that we have to cling to something and, and have it remain the same for it to be authentic, and, but then I use the word authentic mischievously because within the convention, I think we're getting ahead, we don't use the word authentic either in the convention. There is, it's not a word that is used simply because ICH will change over time, right? The best, the best uh, story that I've heard too with respect to ICH and it, and it changing and uh, the why not to use the word authentic is is this one the the guy said that and I many have heard it where the uh, one day they were preparing Christmas dinner and uh, the mom you know the mom the grandmother is there and so the the grand she's preparing and she cuts off the wings off the turkey and puts it in the in the pot and so the child the grandchild asks um mom why are you um cutting off the the wing off the turkey. And she says, mm, I, don't, I don't know. I used to see grandma do it. And so it turns to grandma. Grandma, why do, you cut, why, did you, why do you cut off the wing off the turkey? He says, well, that's because in those days, the pot, the pot was too small, right? So they thought that it was some, it was some cooking thing, but it's, it was just a matter of the pot being small. And so now you have a bigger pot and you're still cutting off the cutting off the wing, but not understanding why, right? So uh, ICH will, will change over time. 
And uh, the more immersed in it, the better you'll be able to, to understand why these changes occur. And sometimes for things to survive, you have to, talking about transmission, you have to let it go, meaning be willing to share it. Daryl shared with me in an earlier conversation, he says that some people, want, uh, they cling to a thing so much, they're so passionate about it, and it's counterintuitive, right? They hold on to it thinking that it will survive, but in order for it to survive, you want to share it, right? And, and that's a, another key concept there. So in com terms of comparing the diversity of cultural expressions, convention, and ICH, diversity deals with cultural activities, goods, and services, cultural expressions, which are often new, and individual creation. So that's creative, creativity. It focuses on cultural industries, dissemination, and development. ICH deals with skills, practices, expressions, and knowledge. It is a collective practice transmitted, now this is key, from generation to generation. In order to, in order to something to be deemed an ICH, it is a practice which must be transmitted and has been transmitted from generation to generation. All right, Adriana, I saw your hand up. We also want, it also focuses on uh, safeguarding practice and the transmission of ICH, which is something we'll be looking at later on. So that's just the distinction between the ICH convention and the diversity of cultural expression and the World Heritage Convention. So this is what the text of the convention looks like. You have this document again, this is the, these are the key headings. There's a preamble. There's article one, which deals with the purposes of the convention. Article two, which deals with definitions. Articles four to 10, dealing with the organs of the convention, meaning the, the various bodies that operate within the convention. Articles 11 to 15, deals with safeguarding at the national level. The, the art, article 16, deals with lists and register. Six to, uh, 16 to 18. Uh, articles 19 to 24 deals with international cooperation and assistance. Articles 25 to 28 deals with the ICH fund, from which the funding came for this particular project. Articles 29 and 30 deals with reporting. And by the way, Grenada has already completed its first periodic report. Just uh, was it last year, Daryl? So uh, Grenada is, is already well on its way in terms of. Yes. Uh, all right. So the, what's interesting about the Grenada experience here, Daryl, uh, since you said that, is that Grenada didn't start with the implementation at the, at the top in terms of the, con the convention and its parts. Grenada started with the reporting. But an interesting feature of the reporting is that Grenada was able to set certain targets within that report as the things they'd be seeking to achieve in time for the next reporting cycle. And so this is a, an important step that you're taking today. And then, of course, Articles 32 and 33 deal with the issue of ratification. If I remember correctly, Grenada ratified in 2009. They ratified the uh, Convention for the Safeguarding of Intangible Heritage. It is one of the most popular conventions around the world. Many states have come on because it is such an important uh, step toward uh, the safeguarding of intangible cultural heritage nationally, locally, and internationally. So getting into the convention itself, Article 1 deals with safeguarding, with the concept of respect, respect for intangible cultural, key concept, awareness and mutual appreciation, international cooperation and assistance. Right? So Article 1 sets out the terminologies and descriptions associated with those four concepts. There are two lists in the convention, and they are called the representative list of the intangible cultural heritage of humanity. In short, you can call it the RL, the representative list of the intangible cultural heritage of humanity. And then there is the USL, which is the list of intangible cultural heritage in need of urgent safeguarding. So you have ICH that's viable. Those go internationally to the representative list. And then you have those that are endangered, use the term endangered, those go to the, under Article 17, to the USL, the Urgent Safeguarding List. So, in, so to give you some examples, in 2018, is it 2018? Was it 2018? 
it feels like more recently. But there yeah, are Jamaica's reggae. Reggae music of Jamaica was inscribed onto the representative list, right? And the interesting thing about reggae is that reggae, while it originated in Jamaica, it is also universal. So it's one of those ICH where you can go anywhere in the world and you'll hear people singing the Bob Marley emancipation, emancipation song, no? a redemption song, right? And reggae has, is performed in multiple languages around the world. So here you can see how an ICH at the national level also has some global, some global influence. So the goal would be for you to begin to think, Grenada, is there some element that you would like to have nominated at some point in the future onto the representative list of the intangible cultural heritage of humanity? Here is an element that was inscribed on the urgent safeguarding list. This is Carolinian wayfinding and canoe, canoe making in Micronesia. So it's the, the two components to this element. This was inscribed in 2021. It involves uh, the learning the ancient tradition of, of what they call wayfinding without maps or instruments no? in Micronesia by, by sea using the islands, the stars, the sky, uh, 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 astronomical, sorry, astronomical features in the sky and, uh, and as well the art of building these, these canoes, right? So you can see an example there. We have also two boat traditions I heard you reference boat building in Grenada, right? So in this case, Micronesia had submitted a nomination which was inscribed in 2021, the Carolinian Wayfinding and Canoe Making. There's a third uh, feature of, and this is called a register. It is called a register of good practices or good safeguarding practices. So what UNESCO also looks for are examples globally of good practices of places or scenarios or instances where there are safeguarding practices happening that can serve as a model for the rest of humanity. So this is an example from the, the Philippines. It is at what is called a school of living tradition. And so this is a particular community-based school managed by leaders and practitioners. Uh, it, it's done uh, as a both formal and non-formal uh, form of education. Elders will gather, you notice the children, just in that picture alone, you see youth and children involved in, in the discourse being led by, and the elders, it's a systematic way of passing on the living traditions there in the, in the Philippines, all right? So can you think of examples that, uh, that might be similar? It doesn't have to be a school. Are there examples currently in Grenada that you might consider good safeguarding practices, practices that are keeping particular cultural elements alive? All right. So in terms of the organs of the convention, there are three primary organs for our purposes here. One is the General Assembly, and they, we say that this is the sovereign body of the convention. Our states, parties, are members, and the General Assembly is where um, operational directives are amended, uh, budgets are allocated and, and so on. Then there is the Intergovernmental Committee, which is a subset of the General Assembly. The Intergovernmental uh, Meeting will elect 20, 24 states. There are 24 states representing the five regions across the, the world in which UNESCO uh, has designated states. So we're in the Latin American and Caribbean grouping. You have Africa, you have the North African region, the Sub-Saharan African region, Europe, Asia and so on. And um, there are 24 countries representing those regions who are involved in what is called the Intergovernmental Committee. And any inscriptions for argument's sake to the, U, to the urgent safeguarding list or the representative list or the register of good safe practices will go as recommendations to the Intergovernmental Committee who will then vote to, uh, not to, have to inscribe an element at the international level. And then the work of both the General Assembly and the Intergovernmental Committee is supported by the UNESCO Secretariat. So there is a secret secretariat headed by, uh, they, they call him the secretary, secretary of the convention. And they coordinate all of this work that happens, the workshops, the trainings, the capacity building, the, uh, the meetings, all of those. So they manage the convention 
on a day-to-day -day basis in collaboration with uh, what UNESCO calls field offices. Uh, so for example, Yuri works at one of the, the field offices, which is a cluster office there in, in Jamaica. And um, so the U UNESCO Secretariat is the third organ. Uh, I see ICH management having a hand up. Yes. Hey, Nigel. Uh, hey, Nigel. We, we have a question about, uh, a very important question about um, whether or not a um, element can can um, be part of two conventions. For example, the question is, what aspects of Shakespeare mass make it part of the ICH convention versus a convention on diversity of cultural expressions? And the, 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 the individual asks that because this has a lot of dimensions that will seemingly qualify it for either conventions. Okay. Thank you for that question. As I understand, okay. So as I understand it, the the convention for intangible cultural heritage creates these lists to increase the visibility of elements from particular countries who wish to have it recognized at the international level. The, co the convention on the diversity of cultural expressions does not have a mechanism like that for, for uh, creating lists right, of, of elements. What they do is that they try to target the creative sector in terms of, uh, and, and to generate, it's affiliated with uh, uh, livelihoods, uh, generating, uh, promoting um, culture as a means for creative expression uh, and, and, and um, sustainability in terms of artists being able to, to make a living and so on. So that's a distinction. No, on the ground, I want, it's important to understand this. We, when, we who live in a particular country, we know that a particular cultural element is part of our tradition, expression, and knowledge, and so on. But we also understand that it might have applications to other sectors of culture, right? And which is separate and apart from how the global mechanisms address culture. So it is important not to try and pinhole our cultural realities strictly in terms of the conventions. Because there are many nuances that we know at the ground level within the states that will not necessarily fit perfectly into the convention. So um, if there is an opportunity for argument's sake to use the Shakespeare's mask to, to, to promote a carnival for argument's sake, or to support the, um, the a kind of a regional carnival initiative. I, I don't know the details of Shakespeare's mass. I'm just thinking off the top of my head. That would be something for the, the diversity convention that allows for creativity and, and all that. But in terms of the save 2003 convention, we're talking about safeguarding, right? One of the conflicts that tends to come up, we were dealing strictly with safeguarding, I think. One of the things that tends to come up uh, as states, and we have persons from tourism here, one of the things that tends to come up is that uh, tourism folks want to take, and I'm not, don't, please don't get me wrong because I'm not disrespecting tourism. They will see cultural elements and want to take it and like make it saleable, right? Commercialize it and so on. While there is some value to doing that from an economic standpoint, from a tourism standpoint, you have to remember that you don't want to jeopardize the elements either simply by making it a commercial enterprise. So oftentimes what I say to people who are, in garden, who are involved in safeguarding cultural elements, you engage in safeguarding your element, the, the cultural heritage, and then let the and then you may collaborate with the tourism people to the extent that tourism or the or commercial activities does not put your element at risk. Let me give you an example. 
Um, the, there's a Maya, we have the indigenous Maya here in, in Belize, right? And uh, the, there's this move to education, tourism, to bring foreigners into the communities so they can learn to see how the Maya live traditionally and, and so on. And then what begins to happen, the, the tourists come and they spend two, three days living in a traditional hut, making corn meals and corn uh, foods and all this sort of thing. But they come with, uh, they come with, um, with uh, nice watches and Nike tennis shoes and, um, and knapsacks and all these sorts of things. And before you know it, these American commercial products end up in the in the community, right? Um, not that that is, is a bad thing, but what it begins to do, it begins to affect the way of life uh, of, the, of, of, of the persons, no? Um, so whereby before, um, it, it begins to change the thinking from a traditional way of living to a more West, and again, people are free to, to do that if they want, but you have external cultural influence heavily influencing the indigenous community. And then that begins to affect how they, how they, how they view, view their own life. They even begin to, some people even say that begin to undervalue their own way of, way of living, no? And that, is, and that is something to be conscious of. So the short of it is, if you are safeguarding, you safeguard. If you are going and you have to be cautious that if you get into the domain of commercializing, you don't want to over commercialize to the extent that it puts the element at risk of, this, uh, of becoming something that it's not, right? Yeah, yes, uh, Ezra. I was just curious that uh, for the audience um, uh, standpoint, um, how, how would you just suppose uh, what you just share about the, the Mayans um, in the Belizean border with Guatemala, um, how um, you just suppose that with, let's say, reggae music? Because one of the reasons why I, I think reggae music um, is the way it is, even though it's very co commercial, along with the music, you have a lifestyle, you know, the, 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 the Nazi dread hairstyle, and everybody wants to emulate that, the, the bells, the ice green and gold colors, and all of that. Uh, it, would, would that be a, a version of when, when you say um, the balance is not striped, that is it's over commercialized or it's, it's a sort of a uh, continuation or celebration of that aspect of Jamaican heritage? Well, well, not all elements have the same characteristics, right? Oh. So that's, that's also something important to remember. So, and thing like something like Jamaica, like reggae and so on, it allows to for creative expression, no? Right? And so this is what I was getting at earlier. It over, while reggae itself of Jamaica is inscribed, it also overlaps into the creative sector. Right. So back to your question, uh, Ezra, um, the question of reggae. So some, each element, ha they have their own characteristics. And so the best way to picture reggae is that the, the culture and the essence of it is so strong that it radi radiates outward, no? So, so it's a thing where people try to, just like you said, mimic and so on, what's happening internally. And so it doesn't affect per se what happened in, in the essence of it, right? So that's something that can, that can expand outward continuously. So other elements like at the, that, are, that occur in small communities and so on, I'll give you an example like a boat building. I remember being in a village where this, uh, going, I went down to the seaside and this man, this old man is uh, there cleaning his fish. And I, I, was, I was deliberately looking for boat builders on the coast. And uh, so I asked him, I said, um, do, you, do you have a, a, wooden, a wooden boat? He says, no, no, I, I don't make them anymore. He said, but why? He said, because, um, well, everyone is using fiberglass now. So it's cheaper to buy, buy one that lasts longer, right? And... Um, so you can see there, there, that's the opposite scenario. We're at that very small level, that, that very community-based level, an external thing like fiberglass and so on has put the actual art of boat building at risk, right? And he says, well, an additional advantage for me is that I, with, 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 with the um, fiberglass, it's lighter. I can paddle further. 
and I don't need an additional man to help me pull up the dory, right? So you can see the opposite is happening there. So all of the elements will have their own, their own characteristics, no? So looking now on the slide uh, and the question of operational directives. So you have the, the text of the convention, the articles, and then you have the operational directives. So these are guides that help with the implementation of the convention. Uh, those of you who will be working with the technical aspects will become more and more familiar with this. Uh, those are the regulations and procedures for inscription to the list and register and uh, accessing the fund, as well as reporting obligations. So the state is obligated to report on, the, on its steps and so on. The, the operational directives give you the parameters for doing that. It is prepared by the committee and approved by the General Assembly. We talked about the two organs. So the first one was approved in 2008. It was amended and enlarged in 2012 and 2014. So as the convention progresses and it's being implemented and so on, uh, there are discussions that happen with different aspects of it, and they amend the operational directives to, to accommodate the concerns that are, that are raised. But the more you become involved with it at the international level, the more you'll be familiar with some of the changes that occur from one period to the next. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. So articles 25 and 28 uh, deal with the funds itself. It mainly supports safeguarding, inventory making, and capacity building. But there, there's some other, um, it does accommodate other types of safeguarding uh, initiatives. Uh, the fund might also, for argument's sake, support your, uh, you wanting to prepare a nomination file for inscription at the international level, which is also a, a safeguarding initiative. Uh, states parties contribute to the fund. That's how it gets its money. Um, some states make additional contributions. So the Japanese, the Chinese, the Dutch, uh, the Belgians, they all over the, over the years make uh, different contributions. Uh, state parties may also request financial assistance singly or jointly. So maybe one of these days, uh, Grenada might want to, after having done its inventory, you might realize that... Um, uh, that if there's a similar element in one of the other islands in the region, you might want to submit a joint application for funding with that territory. The fund, the, the reviewers of the application look, uh, they look more favorably on these joint applications because it shows international and regional cooperation, right? And that they, try, that, that they interpret that to mean that there is viability and action with respect to particular ICH elements. And you will note here that there are few requests for assistance that have received, been received so far, yeah. right? And, um, and you are one of the states that has access that, that fund. So congratulations on that, right? What are the obligations of state parties in the convention? One, under Article 11, you're responsible to safeguard ICH in your territory. That's an obligation in broad terms. Another obligation, you're to ensure community participation in identifying and managing their ICH. Notice, in managing their ICH. The ICH does not belong to the state. It belongs to the communities. So that's an obligation, right? Of course, the state, with all those obligations, will have to drop mechanisms in order to do that effectively. So, so one way of doing it is to give a national trust being given the, the, the authority to go ahead and apply for funding and to implement. So that's one example of how you ensure uh, community-driven participation. The state is also obligated to draw up inventories of ICH in their territory. So when we go into the second workshop, we'll be looking at this, this idea of drawing up inventories under Article 12.1. If you ever decide to nominate one of your elements to the international level, to any of the lists, the representative list, the urgent safeguarding list, or the register of good, of, good, of good practices, you will have to have an inventory in place. Without it, the application would not be approved. So you need to have a national inventory in place. One of your obligations is to contribute to the fund and to report to the committee. Okay. So what are the benefits of implementing the convention? Well, ensuring the well-being of communities. Communities, it triggers and animates communities to know that their culture is being respected and, and, and that there is a desire to have it safeguarded at the local and national level. It builds respect and understanding between communities. 
Because so many times we see in our societies, we see things happening, we don't understand why it happens. And once we begin to engage it, all of a sudden, we develop a new appreciation for it, no? There's also the benefit of sustainable development. You know, when we are able to link it to livelihoods in a responsible way, um, it does translate well and bode well for sustainable. A good example of that in the region would be steel pan music, right? Steel pan originated in Trinidad, but it's also expanding outward uh, and many schools teach it and so on. Children learn it. You have bands that participate in carnival. People get paid to perform. That's a very good example of sustainable development with respect to a, a single element. There is, of course, the enhancement of cultural diversity and human creativity, which comes from uh, the in implementing the convention. Human creativity comes forth um, once you, you are able to animate societies and, and communities. No? At the international, in terms of international cooperation assistance, uh, one of the benefits is that there is the ability to share expertise and information internationally, um, to share safeguarding practices, to access assistance from the fund, to nominate elements and safeguarding projects, to participate in the organs of the convention. One of the things that the state will be encouraged to do is to send representative, representatives to the General Assembly uh, to have your ambassador or your culture uh, expert or your minister, whoever is the focal point, attend these meetings so that you become a part of the decision making. Because you see those 24 states that I referred to earlier at the intergovernmental level, you can become one of those states that is elected into that 24 and you get to make decisions about the convention. And that gives you some power at the international level, right? And of course, to cooperate regionally and internationally uh, on shared heritage, right? One of the, the, the popular meetings that uh, people try to attend will be the end of year meeting in December. Um, that's the intergovernmental committee meeting. That's where the elements are discussed and described and so on. And something that I would suggest strongly at this point that the state begins to look at and to take advantage of because UNESCO does cover the cost of at least one person traveling, uh, at least from developing states. The UNESCO does cover costs if you're able to apply in time uh, for support to attend that meeting. No? So it's important to have the state represent and, and, uh, at the international level. All right. And then in conclusion then, um, the convention aims that safeguarding ICH will take and by communities in the context of sustainable development and mutual respect. It aims at fully involving communities in any actions concerning their ICH and to empower communities. And it aims at enhancing cultural diversity, human creativity, mutual understanding, and international cooperation. Okay. And then the convention, as a recap, is run by the Intergovernmental Committee, controlled by the General Assembly, both of which are assisted by the UNESCO Secretariat. So the, the, the Ministry of Culture, uh, the, Dutch, the Grenada National Trust will already have some experience with dealing with the UNESCO Secretariat. And then to expand your role internationally by participating at the intergovernmental committee level and in the general assembly. So you become a world player in this convention. Um, the convention has operational directives, a fund, two lists, and a register of good practices. So you, you know the operational directives are the procedures for implementing the, the convention, the fund. To which, to which international assistance and even technical assistance can be from, provided to Grenada. Uh, the two lists, which is the representative list and the urgent safeguarding list and the register of good practices. The convention upon ratification imposes some obligations on the state parties. We're not, we, there are very few and we look at that in the next uh, unit. And then the implementation brings benefits for state parties communities concerned and their stakeholders. The best way to measure your success with Grenada of how well you implement this convention is if you see your communities actively engaged in safeguarding, that will tell you if you have succeeded and are successfully implementing the convention. So that's one of the best ways to, to, to gauge the success of implementing. No? All right, so this brings us to how are we with time, uh, Ezra? 
Um, well, this is a great time, but before we break, I, I, I raise my hand because I, I think uh, at this juncture, I'd like the uh, participants to, to get some uh, feedback from you on the role of public policy in this whole process. Because if you take uh, fishing, subsistence fishing. Ezra? Yes? Ezra? Can you, are you all hearing Ezra? Yes. 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 Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I just, we had a point for a break. But I just wanted to pause so the participants can get your feedback on, on the following, um, on the role of public policy in this process. Um, if you take subsistence uh, fishing, for example, you will find that um, we have a depletion of a lot of the fishes. If you go fishing now, you would not find a lot of fish. And there's a reason for that, because when you folks throw a fish, uh, a fish pot, you know, and um, they're doing their fishing with their nets. They, they catch in everything, all the baby fishes and uh, fishes that barely mature to lay the eggs and all that. So after a while, we have nothing. And the only way you can get compliance uh, to stop doing that is through somebody that has enforcement um, um, capability. And that's only, let's say, typically the government. So I, I just wanted to give some feedback on the role of public policy. Uh, in terms of enforcement, so that we, uh, uh, ICH um, could be alive and thriving, like fishing. Well, one of the um, first observations I'd want to make is that you, it's important for the state to go through through its community actors to conduct an assessment of where what well, constitutes its ICH and the state of its ICH. Once you're able to do that, then it puts you in a position to be able to begin to think about policy. Right? Because when you're going through the documentation, the inventory exercise, one of the things you'll be looking at is the viability of the element meaning how well is it surviving? How well will it survive into the future, right? And uh, once you are able to, and are there any risks or threats to the element, those will be parts of what you'll be doing. And so when you make that assessment, it will tell you at the community level, it will tell you at the NGO level, it will tell you at the state level, what policies you might need to pursue in order to safeguard the particular element. Now, you were referring to fishing. Fishing in itself is, is not uh, a, 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 a economic activity and so on, but what you'd want to do is to examine what about the fishing constitutes intangible cultural heritage. Is there a particular style or way through which fishing is done? Um, are there particular um, traditions and rituals that go with it, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, but, and, I, and this is a good example, listening to you, Ezra, this is also a good example of where some elements overlap into other, into other domains. No? But whether you address it from the cultural domain or you address it in terms of um, your, what you call it, your, your marine life or natural heritage domains, but one of the things to always come back to are, are what are the cultural elements, the living heritage elements contained within whatever you're trying to do from a policy standpoint. The, the, having some experience in this, the only thing I can tell you is what most states will try to do, and they'll try to deal with it holistically, you know, um, in terms of broader state policy, right? It, it, um, that might be that might be the smarter thing to do because of resources. But in terms of at the community level, communities can develop policies to govern, govern themselves too about what they will and will not do with respect to particular, particular elements, right? So you have to think about policies not only at the state level, but also at the community, at community level, right? An example being, so that I'm not speaking broadly, an example being um, if, if uh, Will we as a community have any protocols in place if we are approached by foreigners to come explore our traditional medicine? 
Are we going to have any protocols in place if researchers want to find out about um, our this uh, uh, our boat, our boat building? Are they going to be required to get uh, consent from us before doing that, right? So this is what I mean by communities themselves being able to develop policies to govern themselves with respect to uh, having others respect the ICH that their knowledge that they are in possession of or practitioners of. Right? One, final, one final point before we go to break. Um, is uh, you know when I talk about uh, public policy, I was also going to go to technology. If we stay with fishing for a moment, the traditional practice has been the fisherman who goes out with his oars, you know those wooden oars, he oars out, and now he can be stationary to you know to do this age-old practice of fishing. But now um, you know that's gone because of technology. So they have engines, so they can't be really stationary to, to, to catch fish anymore. So, the, so technology is a not, a not a, is a sort of a, a disruptor um, in our in our traditional practices of fishing. So um, it's something that we also have to um, uh, examine when we when we start um, inventing why certain practices um, uh, disappear just because technology is around. So is that something that the participants should begin considering or thinking about? when they're thinking in terms of safeguarding um, ICH? Most, most certainly. For those of you who are practitioners and knowledge bearers of particular elements, uh, that you certainly want to think about what are the things that put the, your element at risk. Because by you, if you're able to identify it, it may give you the opportunity to find ways around it. You know? So, or, or, to, or to adapt to the condition. So that's something you definitely want to, to think about uh, for yourself as to what are the risks to your element survival, right? And to ensure its future viability. Uh, that's, a, that's a good one. Uh, are there any further comments or questions from the, um, from the participants? We had a break time point, uh, Nigel. We're a little over, maybe about uh, 10, 15 minutes. So, uh, but we still want to, we still don't want to exceed the boundary, the end boundary line. So we may have to do some editing on our feet as we go through sure. the final segment um, so we can fall with the 12.30 departure time. Because I know folks have to get back to their offices and um, make phone calls, have lunch and so on. Okay. All right, so we'll we'll pause for a break then. Thank you. We'll pause for a break, and uh, when we come back, I want to look at a couple of comments that were that I saw here in the chat, uh, and then we will go looking at the final unit of for today's session: key concepts of the convention. And then we'll call it a day. So let's reconvene in six minutes at nine fifty. Sorry, Jordan. Sorry, so I can make up that time. Thank you, guys. All right, so. Uh, let's look then at uh, some of the key concepts in the in the convention before we, we wrap up today. And here you see a, a word cloud of the convention, and these are and this is important for the technicians and for the people in the media. Uh, I, I like to say, you know, because when you begin to to support the the work of implementing the convention, these are the Mm -hmm. These are some of the terminologies you might be using to help to bring that awareness to the broader uh, Grenadian society, no? right? And you, you see, uh, of course, just the UNESCO. A lot of people, uh, when they hear UNESCO, they think they say UNICEF, they say um, UNDP, they say all other sorts of UN, but this is, the, this is a specific agency responsible for education, one of the UN agencies education, science, and, and culture, you know? um, Communities, it's uh, going to be a constant uh, term. Uh, it's a community-centered convention. And when we, say, when we talk about convention, we're talking about an agreement or an international treaty. And it just so happens that this particular convention deals with safeguarding intangible cultural heritage. Um, we, we talk about uh, heritage as a whole, we talk about state parties, 
and the state party that is refers to Grenada, the state of Grenada and its government who, for example, ratified the convention and have certain obligations for implementing the convention. Uh, one of the key functions, again, obligations of the is safeguarding, right? Uh, agreeing and looking at the international instruments, right? So you see all the, the terminology is there, you know? And so the more you, you, we go through this workshop, we'll hear these terminologies used and uh, it will help to, to um, contextualize, excuse me, what we're looking at, you know? So we'll be looking at the convention as a, being a flexible instrument. We'll be looking at anchoring the convention, meaning what kind of, uh, in what ways can we in Grenada and you in Grenada with uh, anchor the convention to understand it in a way that's that, that you that is best for you. We'll be looking at the terms intangible heritage, concept of elements, which I've already introduced, communities, groups, and individuals, and the concept of safeguarding. So the convention is a, a flexible instrument. It's a very rigid. There are few obligations by the state as we talk about. The, there are few obligations by the state. There are few definitions. Uh, some definitions are open. Um, and, and we'll see what we mean by that shortly. Um, the convention contains a list of uh, classifications which are non exhaustive. They use the term in the convention domains of ICH. And uh, they use the term safeguarding measures, but they're not exhaustive because what we've found is that some states outside of the convention have their own uh, ways of classifying the elements. Once they do the inventory exercise, they have their own ways of classifying the elements. The only thing I would say in this regard is, is if you're going to sub submit an element to the international level, then you, you, you're required to use one of the domains uh, inside the convention. But that's, that's not a very complex thing to do. So, so I'll, I'll give you a good example of one of the common ones. Some countries designate the language itself as an ICH element, right? right. Um, the, the patois, I heard uh, a couple of colleagues in the room mention the patois or, or other um, variations of, of languages that are spoken in the region or that might be spoken in Grenada. And so they classify that by itself. But what the convention says about that is that language itself can be inscribed at the international level. You could do it at the state level, but it can't be inscribed at the national level, at the international level, simply because the way it's defined is that language is a medium for transmission, right? Uh, for the folk tales and oral traditions and, and so on. So what you would inscribe instead <clears throat> would be the folk tales and oral traditions and not the, and not the language because the language is just the medium uh, for, for transmission in the context of the convention. But what some states will do is that they'll classify language as an element by itself because they want to raise the profile of the language at the national level. So to give it importance, because one of the things that's now recognized globally is that while we have the international languages of English and French and, and Spanish and, and so on and, the, uh, and Mandarin, one of the things we realize that from a cognitive standpoint, even speaking our patois or local languages, that also helps with uh, cognitive development, no? So if you are able to speak you know, the, the local language, be able to, to speak uh, uh, English and other languages, it actually helps your cognitive development and becoming bilingual and multilingual. And it helps with your understanding of, of, of the world in general, no? um, through, through language. So that's uh, something to think about as an example there, where the classifications inside the convention are non-exhausting. And there is no official glossary uh, uh, attached to this convention. So here you see, how other states uh, anchor the convention in the in the various languages, right? Uh, you see the 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 Swahili language there for translating the term intangible cultural heritage, right? You see the Vietnamese reference. I'm not going to attempt to, to pronounce these, by the way. 
you see the Bulgarian reference, Japanese reference. Anyone here could help? If anyone familiar with these languages? Mukai. See the Estonian reference, the intangible cultural heritage. The Portuguese seems a little bit more recognizable. Patrimonio cultural y material in Spanish. It's a to be Portuguese. similar, right? Uh, it's a cultural, a material cultural patrimony. Is there, the question for you would be in Grenada, is there some other way in which you describe intangible cultural heritage? Do you, for example, or do you, for example, you use the term intangible cultural heritage prior to, to, to the day, for argument's sake? Is, is that a concept that you would have used prior? And feel free to, someone to raise their hand and to comment if you have anything to say on that question. And if not, what, what did you use? How, how did you describe ICH? I see um, uh, Ezra and Margaret hands up. From what I can see on my screen, maybe there might be other hands. Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yes, Nigel, um, I, I think uh, you posed a question when we reconvened, uh, in what ways we can anchor the conventions. I think uh, at this point, maybe uh, for the participants, um, maybe, maybe you can talk about some of the practices and procedures you have seen um, uh, towards that effort. Because when you have a practice, you know, the, the, these repeated activities that rarely uh, cement uh, folks um, familiarity with a technique for CD garden, I, I think that we, we will have to get there. So do you have any share for what other um, places have used in terms of practices to, to safeguard their ICH and some of their procedures? In terms of what we're looking at right now, uh, uh, Ezra, um, we're looking at it from a linguistic standpoint, no? Um, I know an alternate reference from what I've, and I, I am a primarily, I do speak a, a form of Patois uh, here in, in Belize. Uh, we speak some Spanish um, and uh, in English, the alternative, and even the convention has moved towards this reference in the English language, uh, referencing the, the ICH as living heritage. So that's another way through which uh, it's referenced uh, and now at the international level. And this is, a, this is a recent development as a result of uh, states going through the implementation. So another way that the English speaking world describes it is living, living heritage. In Spanish, it would be similar to the Portuguese reference here. And then uh, in Patois, where I try to recall, um, we just say, just use the word culture loosely, you know, culture. Just as we all, we all use, uh, might, might use it, but I can't assume that you do the same in, in, um, in, in Grenada, no? Right? Um, it says you do have nuances from society to society. So I'm just asking the question, um, would it, what would be the similar re reference in Grenada? Is this living heritage an acceptable way of referring to it in terms of you anchoring it, the convention, or, or is there some other way that people understand it? No, it might be in more words than, 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 than that is here, no? Darby wanted to say something and Margaret wanted to say something. No, I was just going to say in Grenada, once you say to a Grenadian, that is we culture. The conversation finished, you understand exactly what you mean. We culture, all right, right. It gives us a certain emphasis, right? It has a certain connotation, am I right? Good, yeah. good, we culture, all right. Uh, Margaret, you wanted to share? Um, I had actually tapped it by mistake. I apologize. Okay, okay. Were there any other hands up? Gloria, you see your hand up? Right, I just wanted to raise a concern. You know, some persons feel that they want to preserve the culture to the extent that they don't want to give out information. So they are preserving men that it stays with them. 
So I ha had contacted someone to have an interview about Tivoli dramas, for example. And I mean, he was, was adamant that if I wanted this information, I have to pay. So we have to really find a way to educate the population that people are going to be asking those questions. And the reason why we ask is to preserve these intangible parts of our culture. And you don't even need to hold on to it to the extent that nobody must ask you. And if they want the information, you need to pay them for it. Just, just making that comment here. Thank, thank you, Gloria. And I jump in here and it's to tag on to what Ms. Bonaparte was just um, bringing to our attention. And that is really to echo what she's saying. Um, one of the things that I've been kind of chomping at a bit and hopefully it comes up later, if not, not now, um, it's, I call it community fatigue, particularly here on Carrier Crew. And I think uh, Carrier Crew is here will agree with me that we've had so many projects loving and on carrier coup is about to choke us to death. Mm. So it's to the point now where some of it is just people being tired of answering questions and seeing it go nowhere. Mm. And they've said that to me unedited. Honestly, that's how they feel. And I have to, to respect and understand and, and to some degree agree with them. When I was told how many times they've told their story, only for the story not to be retold. And that brings perhaps a question for the Grenada National Trust about where is the repository going to be? That's the question that the community continues to ask. Well, where is all this going? How do you know? I don't have the technical skill to do all that stuff. So, so those are some of the, the knee-jerk responses that I'm anticipating. And I would love to hear more from people with more experience about how to overcome that as an objection. Right, right, right. Well, I, I really want to answer that one. In my opening remarks, I kept reminding people that this is your project. It's not ours, the National Trust. And what we don't want, while we are here to facilitate we don't want all this information to end up in a, in a filing cabinet in the National Trust Office and nobody using it. So part of the project is for you to say, and we do this collectively, how this information will be shared, what platform. It has to be used for education mainly. Um, sometimes you want to recover costs. You want to think that you could collect information and, and commercialize it you know, have some kind of subscription or selling book or whatever. But the thing is, um, if you want to educate everybody, which is the primary concern that the trust has, um, you don't want price or money to be a barrier either. So you, have, so you have to collect the information, share it, and find a way to share it that people can access it without the cost becoming um, a barrier, which is why it's very good for us to have um, donors like UNESCO, who will cover some of the costs, at least, um, of, of gathering all this data. And that is why also um, we, we have a limited budget and we are trying to work as we go through this workshop, how, how to share out whatever resources we have. So this has to be like a mission where people think first, look, let's get the job done and then we will discuss how to to make this sustainable commercially or financially afterwards. We have to get this done. This is like rescue work, okay? There are resources there that can be shared, um, but this is not the priority. This is not a commercial activity. Yeah, if I could just say something, we'll go to this for a minute. I just wanted to say something there uh, to follow up on, on Daryl and Margaret's comments. The, um, one of the, the things to think about, there is a, that, that thing about financial, that's something you have to negotiate, uh, how to deal with that, but the probably awareness raising is an important way. But another thing to think about is that there are also ethical considerations when doing this kind of work. Um, and I, I can tell you from experience uh, that, that I can understand fully what you're saying that community will get frustrated. One of the practices that I've seen develop in some countries, if you go into the communities to do inventory, 
and you, you say that you're going to make a documentary about, let's say you're going to make a documentary about drumming. You don't just go to the community, and Gloria, I'm not uh, talking about this, you, I'm just giving you a scenario. You, you don't go to the community and, uh, and say, we're going to make a documentary, we want the information. And then the documentary airs in, in uh, the International Film Festival in Jamaica, and the community have no idea that that happened. Um, so what you want to do, if you're going to do this sort of thing, you actually go back to the communities with an edited version for them to look at and to critique. I remember having first time experience. Sometimes you can misrepresent the very thing you did the work on, the documentation work on. I remember uh, we did, we spent a few months working in a particular community, prepared, uh, did all the documentation, the inventory work, inventory the element, and then we said, okay, one of the outputs is also a, 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 docu a, a mini documentary that we'll show at the festival. And when we took back to the community, uh, to look at the community and say, no, 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 that's not correct how that is represented. This is, is how, this is the correct representation of what you have there. And so that feedback was important because if we had gone ahead and aired the thing without taking it back to them, for them to see, uh, we would have had uh, some serious backlash, no? So it's, uh, it, it, sometimes it can be slow and tedious, but if this, this is what you intend to do, you have to follow certain guidelines. If you're going to engage a community, they must be involved in the development of the project. They have to be involved in the finalizing whatever it is that is being produced. And they have to have, give you the final say, um, right? because it, it's really their, their ICH, no? And um, so to the point where it becomes we culture, no? Uh, that you want to work it to, to, to war that collective, where everybody feels pride about our drummers, about our Shakespeare masks, about our boat building and so on, no? So that's certainly one of the ethical considerations, always going back, circling right back to the community with whatever outputs are, are produced so that they can see it, appreciate it, no? And there are roles for the media there too, right? The, the, the people want to see themselves on the news. People want to see themselves in documentaries. You picture it, you know, the, you, 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 one of the goals is for you to produce uh, materials for schools. Imagine the kid goes home to, at night and, and and uh, Granny, I'm just using my part one. Granny, look, look, look here, look what teacher give us. And they open the book and they scroll, and Granny, see you're in the book, right? That, that is the sort of personal touch you want with the implementing this convention. People want to see their grandmothers and their father drummers and their father the fishermen and, and, and so on. And, and that is what will, will, will give you the success that, that you need, no? So, um, in terms of anchoring the convention, um, that may become your, your catch line. We, we culture. Who knows how, how you decide to pursue this, no? Right? T Tesfa, um, could we hear from you, please? Yes, yes I just in my capacity, for example, as, as a researcher and somebody who is interested in these things from a sort of academic point of view that I think that's an important link between communities and the sort of project that is being undertaken um, through the National Trust is that one of the things that researchers have and that academics have is that understanding of ethics and so on that are built into the process when we undertake research. And so I think it's important to have that sort of voluntary commitment from and to partner with people who can write these things, people who understand um, what's at stake, for example, when we enter into communities, and that there's they're they're building these linkages between the work that's being undertaken through this um, facilitation, but uh, also that they're also tasked with systematizing, archiving information. There's an important, uh, we, we say we don't want this information to end up in a file cabinet somewhere, but ar archiving is also an important aspect of how information is transmitted, right, and passed on. So obviously there are different elements to, to how we want to approach this as well. And, and to speak to the point of um, people not wanting to let go of their cultures, I mean, uh, let go of the information, 
uh, there, I mean, there are some religious practices, for example, that are secret, that belong to the realm of the secret, right? That belong to that people just would not want to tell you that it's passed on through all world traditions. Another thing that is very much um, an intervention in a society like Grenada, for example, where we um, sort of uh, identify ourselves as a Christian society is that traditional practices like Jab Jab, for example, are identified as devil masks in some quarters. And uh, in, in some cases, parents are parents push back against their children being taught these, uh, these traditions. I just recently um, in Sotez, there was a little, a little um, thing happening with the preschool, with uh, preschool children engaged in a little jab jab sort of mass and it was on Facebook and it was just an exercise in, in the, the teachers identified it as a physical exercise and also you know, an exercise in, in cultural preservation as we would frame it here. But there was a lot of very, um, I would say terrible backlash from the community. People saying, oh, why are you involving our children in job, job? You know, is that the first thing that you teach our children? And da, da, da. So there, there's an understanding here within, uh, within this context of, within the context of this discussion of why we do these things. And then there's a real need to ed educate people around um, why this is important and to get that buy-in from communities and to understand that there, there are various dimensions to this kind of work that do involve archiving, that do involve um, education at, at the level of grassroots it's in very, very deliberate ways. And that is something that uh, I understand that, that this is work that needs to be done, absolutely. But, but then we, we also need to be thinking from the outset about the long-term um, um, prospects of, of this work as well. So I just wanted to, to, to propose that one of the ways that we can do that really effectively is to partner with, with, with researchers, with academics, with people who are interested in this work in that way. For example, that, that is my um, interest in, in being here. This work aligns with the kind of research that I'm doing um, as an academic. Right, and I know that there are others like me as well. So maybe that's something that that we need to be thinking about even now. Thank you. Well said. Thank you very much for that intervention, Tesla. Uh, uh, Ezra. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I think think Tesla has said it has said it best because I. I Yeah, I think I, I think Tesla has said it best because I think from the outset with our awareness initiative, um, the whole discussion should be, you know, we should focus a lot on, on ownership, who owns it. And um, if, if if that is not communicated, then it would always be seen, ICH would always be seen as private possessions and not heritage. Not a community thing, you know. So I, I, I just think that now we need to engage academics, media organizations, um, you know, just spread it out as much as possible because that's how we're going to get the legitimacy. Because each one has their own audience, and when you bring it all together, then we have the the maximum reach that we're looking for. Right, right. Each one has its own audience. Good point. Thank you for for that, uh, Ezra. And so. The, the important thing here is for going forward, you want to anchor it in, in a way that everyone understands what you're talking about. If that's we culture or, or, or saying living heritage or tangible cultural heritage, however you choose to anchor it, that will be key because you want to, to say it in a way that has a, a deeper meaning than just the words themselves. Huh? In terms of the art, the, how the convention is defined, you want to, when you look at your text of the convention, Article 2.1, which says that it's the means, the practices, representation, things, expression, knowledge, and skills. And this is the point I want to get on here, as well as, as the instruments, objects, artifacts, and cultural spaces associated there with. So uh, an important thing here, uh, let's say uh, you, the, you have a group of that are into making the mask. The, the mass themselves are is an object or an artifact uh, of ICH, but the ICH is the in totality is, is the skill involved in making the mass, not just the mass itself. 
All right, just to give you an idea there when we talk about as well as the instruments. So it says as well as. So the skills would go along with whatever the object or artifact is, no? So, so the artifact itself is, is not the full spirit of what, what constitutes intangible cultural heritage. The full spirit will include the skills and knowledge associated with the production or use of artifact, okay? And finally, it says that communities, groups, and in some cases, individuals recognize as part of their culture. So it's again in the community recognizing it. It's not us projecting onto communities, okay? Uh, 2.1 continues and says, ICH is transmitted from generation to generation, which is a key point, and is constantly create, recreated by communities and groups in response to the environment, their interaction with nature and their history and provides them with a sense of identity and continuity, thus promoting respect for, for cultural diversity and human creativity. So a good, good the, the most uh, prominent example I can think of in the Caribbean might be the carnival, no? The, the carnival being an annual festivity in some countries it's associated with Prabhupada, in other states it's associated with the beginning of the Lenten season uh, uh, and so on. So they, but there is, history and the heritage there is a transmission from generation to generation right that contributes to one sense of identity and it promotes cultural respect and human creativity just think about those terms in the context of carnival and you get a good sense of what we're, what we're dealing with there no? it further says for the purposes of the convention consideration will be given solely such ICH as is compatible with international human rights in instruments, as well as the requirements of mutual respect among communities, groups, and individuals, and of sustainable development. What do we mean by human rights instruments? If an element involved in the abuse of, hum of other human beings in whatever way, then it can't be recognized as ICH, right? Um, so it's an inclusive thing. It's supposed to teach respect and for and towards sustainable development. So that's something to, to emphasize there. Right. Here, the Article 2.2 gives you the categories or what we call domains. So when you see Article 2.2, A, B, C, D, and E, these are what UNESCO the Convention describes as, as the domains. So when you think of the elements in terms of convention, you would describe it as, as a performing art or as a social practice, ritual, or festive event, as a knowledge and practice concerning nature and the universe, or as a tra or traditional craftsmanship, or in the case of A, as an oral tradition and expression, which includes language as a vehicle for ICH, noting that language itself is not an element, no? but a vehicle. But, but again, you as a state can have your own additional domains or other categories with the caveat being that if you will inscribe at the international level, then you would want to use, you have to use one of these domains contained within the convention. Uh, I have an example from, uh, it's a, more of a question, uh, which is a, an example from Grenada, but we, we can certainly bypass that for no, no. We've heard of, uh, of course, uh, the Shakespeare the mask, we've heard, we've heard of the drumming, we heard of the building, and we'll get into some of that in more detail as the as the workshop progresses. No, uh, here's a, an example from the Philippines: uh, chanting while uh, harvesting the rice. Role of communities and groups. So defining communities in terms of the convention, and this, this is critical. Under the convention, communities and groups and individuals concerned means those who participate in the practice or transmission of the element and consider it to be part of their cultural heritage. So if you can pick the best way to, to, to think of it is in the middle of any element, you will have a practitioner or knowledge bearers. It could be as few as a single person or as many as hundreds of persons, right? Depending on what the element is. So elements are so in danger that you just have one in the world. You just, you just have some elements that have one practitioner left. 
uh, you might that might be a boat builder, that might be someone who makes uh, uh, model boats. Or so I don't know if there any, is anything like that in, in Grenada. Uh, someone who makes uh, has a particular skill, right? Right. But they participate in the, in the practice, and then out, once you start moving away from the center of that, you have persons participating in different ways in the in the practice and tra transmission. Then you might even have a, outside the circle in a wider sense, you might have those persons who are observers. And the persons who function as observers also help with, uh, also participate, but their participation also contributes to the safeguarding of the element, you know? Because what's the sense of someone being an element? What would be carnival without the people? Then? That, that's, that would be a simple way to, to put it. What would be a boat without uh, the fishermen? What would be Shakespeare's mask without the persons using uh, using the masks, no, or observing and participating uh, and so on? So um, again, it means those who participate in the practice or transmission, starting with the knowledge there or practitioner in the middle, either as an individual or as a group, as a larger number, extending all the way out into the broader society who have uh, investment in the element, right? Again, again, Carnival being one of the more obvious examples in the region. Here's a diagram that gives us an illustration of the relationship between the communities, groups, and individuals, and ICH. So you see the arrow moving to your right. Communities, groups, and individuals concerned, they create, they practice, and transmit. They're stewards, meaning they take care of. They know what the gender roles are with respect to the element, and it's part of their identities. You know? And when we talk about gender roles, and all this simply means is that in some elements, you'll see, uh, you might see families working together, um, men and women working together, and the, the element, it requires particular genders have particular roles. It doesn't mean that it's being sexist or, or discriminatory. All it means is that the while the men are preparing, they are doing the fishing, the women will do the cooking for argument's sake, right? That that is how the, the element manifests itself. And then in return, the ICH at the bottom, you see the arrow moving to the left, gives the communities, groups, and individuals concerned a sense of identity, continuity, enjoyment, self-respect, sustainability, even income generation and establishes gender norms and values. This is one of the things about this convention. Uh, the only restriction is that, the, that there, are, there isn't a violation of human rights. Other than that, if, the, if the, the, it's the woman making the kite and the husband doing the flying, that's just the norm and that's just the norm associated with the element. It's not a thing to be judged or to, to be or to, to be looked at in, in any way because it's not consistent with how you think of it. Uh, it's just how the element itself is a way of establishing gender norms and, and values. So if you want to understand it, it would be better to delve into it and to, and to project judgment onto it. This is a, a tricky part of the convention and understanding IICH. Right. In terms of safeguarding, we, we're almost we're uh, almost in here. Could we, could we have one question? Sure, sure. Go ahead. Okay, go ahead. It's not so much a question as a comment um, that I wanted to make as regards to our situation in here in Grenada. Um, of course, our heritage or intangible heritage has its basis and its roots in the community, but the challenge that we have right now is that using Carnival as an example, we have made so many efforts to almost systematically remove Carnival from the communities, and making it more, more a centralized thing. So over the years, we have even had the ICSA legislation that would pre prevent some activities from the communities that, that would coincide or conflict with national elements of our carnival. So you needed to ask permission to do certain things in the village. And you, you there were then quite a number of um, financial burdens. So for example, Miss Mary, who normally would have a little thing in the playing field, now it became an issue. 
And so what that has resulted in is centralizing carnival, killing carnival in the communities. And so when you come to Grenada for carnival, um, what I am now hearing is that it does not look very different from carnival in other parts of the world. And so we are moving in a direction that I think um, makes us just another cookie cookie cutter um, island in terms of our culture. And we have so very much to offer in, in, in terms of what, what we have. So I just want us to, as we look at all of this, bear in mind that yes, we can stylize and then we can make things um, better for stage or for visitors, but in doing so, as was stated before, we lose key elements. And after a while, for example, seniors, many of them no longer go to activities that, that um, carnival activities or activities like that. In, in few communities that I would have gone, for example, I dance a maple a lot. When we go, go into the communities, not into the city, St. George's per se, but go into the community, and we do it in the way that we've learned you'd see an older person, woman or man will come and say, let me show you how to do it. Now, if, if we were not there by the shop or in the community center or whatever, we would never have the exposure. And they are not going to take a bus and come down to St. George's and, and do that. Because to them, that is nonsense, mash up the thing. So, so in, in, in a conversation with Finn, for example, that is not how, not how you do it. She's not, not with her little foot and her you know, aches and pains going to go down there. So we need to bring these things back into the communities so we can be taught how to do it and to do it properly. You know, Another thing I wanted to share to as we go forward, it always makes sense to begin with the end in mind. And, and as we spoke about the persons being fatigued with the information that they're, they're, they're giving out, that is really true. So it helps to be able to say, this is what we're going to do. And this is when it's going to be available, probably a ballpark, particularly in dealing with young people. They're more immediate. So you're asking me questions, you tell me to go home and video my grandparents or whatever. When am I going to see it? How am I going to get exposure to it or experience with it? And so these are things that we need to consider from the onset as we decide how we're going to be doing that. And I know we talk about you know, documenting and preserving the culture, but here's an idea. Sometimes when you are, you know, sometimes it, say, it takes honey to attract a fly. If we are going to be using the young people to be able to promote, we want to pass it on to them. I have had the experience of, of being humbled. As we go, go into the schools, culture is fluid. So they are also establishing their own culture. Yes, many of them are very interested in what we did before, but it's not their experience. So keep in telling them that it is their culture. They cannot identify with that. So they are creating their own culture now and they're learning, yes, from their grandparents' era and their parents' era. But I went into teaching games into primary school schools in St. David. And I was amazed because the things that I'm seeing they're doing with the intellect that they have in the speed, they started teaching me their, their own ring, ring games that they play outside. So, so the clapping games, I never got it. It was just too fast for me. But they have, have things that they have right now in keeping with their environment. So I'm saying all this to say that as we go forward, these are things that we need to consider so that we don't promote the disconnect. We, we don't expand the generation gap in terms of not understanding or, or they're not understanding. So Miss Finn coming together with Mary or Jane, that's an excellent way for them to understand why she is a mother of the community, respect for her, because this is what she would have done. So we need to, um, I think, um, think about these things as well. Thank, wow. thank, thank you for that. Thank you for that. You, you said a mouthful indeed. Uh, many things to Hold consider. On. Hold on, now. let me get the mute. Oh. Right. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, um, I, I didn't get your name. Marlene. Marlene. Mar Marlene. Okay. So yes, reference. Yes. So that, that's um, you're saying I'm still there, Marlene, and I, I'm hearing you. And I know Ezra is making notes. You have made several considerations. And the other thing about culture getting food is important. Same types of games, different uh, different narratives behind it. No. Um, excellent, excellent point. The centralization of culture. That's that's a major risk. 
um, as well. You, if it belongs to the communities, then that's something we need to think about. Don't let the communities own it and, and still be actively engaged. No? So which brings us then, if you can, if you'd allow me five more minutes, because I know we, we are already past time. Uh, so we can just get through the, the safeguarding concepts. Uh, safeguarding means ensuring the viability of ICH. And when you're doing the documentation and an inventory work, you'll be looking for threats and risks, no? With the viability of the elements. And when we say threat, we're looking at current problems that might hamper the enactment and transmission of the elements. So you've got to actively be looking at that. And Marlene just gave an example, which might be taking, uh, centralizing the element itself is a risk. Uh, making it more commercial and all this other sort of thing, you might actually be putting the thing at, at risk. And if you want people to have, in the context of kind of have a, I don't know the context again, but uh, listening to it, if you want a person to have a, a, a genuine or a, 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 a community experience, then, you know, there, there are different ways to address that particular threat, no? And risks are, are what you call anticipated problems, problems that may arise as a result uh, of the conditions on the ground. So key safeguarding measures here. So you see three of them. Awareness raising, which, which we're doing now in this discussion and in this workshop. So it uh, involves encouraging people to understand and appreciate ICH. There's inventorying, which we'll be doing in subsequent workshop, which is presenting information, ICH elements in a systematic way. Then there is revitalization. I know uh, someone in the, in, the, in the meeting mentioned earlier, some elements have disappeared or might be endangered. And so revitalization is one way to deal with those elements that are endangered you know, and, to, and to try and bring it back into mainstream. If, if that is what the community wants, that's another key consideration. The community wants that to happen because I have actually witnessed the death of ICH elements. Uh, you know, in my own in my own country, no? but in, if the community is not wanted, then there's not much you can do. That's a harsh reality you have to have to face, no? But if there is no need for it, right? Other measures include and the test for, for example, brought us here: documentation and research, identification and definition. Who defines that an element? The the uh, just so one of the things we risk we run that we want, we look at something and you think you understand it. No, 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 no. Get it from, in the words of the practitioner and the knowledge bearer. Don't try to define it in, in, in your own terms. Try and get it in, in their terms as best as possible. Define it, its meaning and definition. Preservation and protection, promotion and enhancement. Uh, the promotion and enhancement part comes through into today's world. It might come through social media. It might come through um, the, the mainstream media. It might come through news. It might come through some organized community event. So there are many various ways to do it. And of course, there is the measure of transition. For example, through education. And this particular project is looking at transmission through, through education as a starting point. No? So what roles do communities play in safeguarding them? So communities will engage in transmission themselves in the teaching of the kite taking from one generation to the next, in the enactment of the ICCH, if there's its performance base, if it's drumming or, or some other element. And the communities will also do the identification, the inventory, the documentation, the research, revitalization, ensuring access to places and materials, the transmission through education and then their awareness raising. And of course, with help from other agencies, if we needed all of these things involved in the community. One of the things to always remember, I, I, I keep, keep forgetting this myself. We come from the communities too. We shouldn't separate ourselves from the, if I'm a professor, a lecturer, a researcher, a cook, a, 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 a NGO leader, don't forget that we too come from the community, right? And we, we, if we have keep that orientation in mind, we're, we're going to, to do well in, in terms of safeguarding from the community perspective. So in conclusion then, ICH is living heritage, and you might want to ground it in terms of phraseology and in the ground in Grenada, I say we culture or uh, as, a, as a future brand, no? however you want to anchor it. It's always changing. The point was just made there, right? It's always changing. 
And so don't be afraid of, it, it, it's what, what you want to be looking at are the values and the functions at the heart of it, do those remain, right? It is defined, recognized, practiced, and transmitted by people, normally communities, groups, and individuals for the stewards of that heritage. So I can't go to the community and tell the drum maker how to make a drum, and I have no idea of how to make a drum much less play, no? based on what I've seen somewhere. No, that's, you're the steward. I want to learn from you. Safeguarding involves assisting communities to continue practicing, managing, and transmitting their ICH. Sometimes, uh, and I've seen it, I've seen it very recently, organizations want to try and dictate to communities what to do with their element. It's very tempting to do, but try and resist the temptation as much as possible, no? To tell communities what to do. Encourage the communities to ask for, uh, that we collaborate and so on, but don't try and manage their ICH. If you can get them to manage it all the better, its viability will be perhaps better guaranteed in that way, all right? Communities, groups, and individuals are not defined under the convention because uh, it, it, it's just hard to capture. So use those three terminologies just there. Says the parties need to involve communities, groups, and individuals in regarding the ICH, paying due attention to mutual respect, mutual relationship between gender roles and, and, and ICH, okay? So um, that, is, that, that is day one of the workshop just uh, introducing us to the convention and key concepts. Um, we, we, Ezra, uh, can we um, take some comments and, and from you and uh, wrap up for the day, please? Well, um, I'll organize uh, 48 participants by Zoom, and I think 14 or 15 at the hotel. So, big, big crowd for the night. Okay, so um, yeah. I'm not going to this up. I think I'm not. Oh, okay. No, I, don't I didn't think she was talking to somebody else. Yeah. Okay, Um, you, you, you have any closing issues? Okay, Um. well, before Ezra comes on, I just want to mention two things that struck me just now. I think it was Margaret um, Carrick who said, said that people, communities fatigue, you know, with this whole question that they've, they've been through this, they've been questioned so many times and they haven't seen a result. So if that is one of our cultural feelings, because I remember that um, visitors to Grenada would always remark how neatly dressed the school kids are, how they always say good morning politely as they pass them. So, so Grenadians are polite people, but it seems as, as though we have forgotten how to communicate the thank you for your participation after we get what we want. So we must not make that um, a problem in this exercise we're doing now. Make sure we go back to the community, show them what we've done and, and, and thank them for their participation. And we, we must have a follow-on project. We can't just let this end up in file storage somewhere so that they could see that the effort they made to co cooperate with us, um, there's an output, there's some document. The second thing that somebody else mentioned was people who want to die with a secret recipe and all this kind of thing. You know, they're holding on to it. Of course, it makes you special when you're the only person who could make fudge that way. It's nice. I mean, you know, we all have a little ego and pride. So, but we don't want that to die with, with, with you. So make sure these things are documented and share that at least with a couple of family members because we don't want to lose these special things. But the key thing is the trust. You see, sometimes people don't want to share with you because they figure you're going to take this and make our money with it or do some commercial exploitation of it that they're not happy with. And they're sitting there on their little secret recipe that they want to share. But that has to, that has to stop now. We can't be thinking so small-minded. If you're not doing anything with your recipe commercially, please share it so the rest of us could enjoy it. So it's the trust that we have to build now with the community. Um, we have to kind of reassure them that this project is different to everything that happened before. This one is a rescue. We're really trying to save stuff here. But forget your personal position. Just try to save this heritage for, for, for the present and future generations, please. Okay, Ezra. 
Yeah, before I um, uh, get to some of the um, questions that came along, uh, I just want to say something about uh, committee fatigue. Um, basically, for me, from my vantage point, how it happens, you know, typically you go to um, international conferences and there are always a bunch of people there willing to offer you something to take back to your country. So that temptation is always there that, that we'll, we'll come back with five initiatives somebody's willing to fund and then uh, you take it to the ministry or you take it to the organization. So that's five. Then you may have 10 people doing dissertation research. So there's another, that's 15 and on and on and on. And before you know it, you have about a hundred people coming to you asking about you know, a variety of things about cuisine, dance, boat building, whatever. So uh, the, the, the issue is that it comes to you in all directions. And the fatigue now, the question is how do we, um, how do we, I guess, use that information so we can make sure that we don't get so um, tied down with all these requests? So that's something we'll have to look at because it presents a lot of problems. The, the, other, the other thing, Ezra, yeah. yeah. I just want to do this point. Yeah. Um, if anybody in the community We're not hearing, uh, we're not hearing our own. Uh, Daryl, we're, we're not hearing you. Sorry. Um, so we don't want to repeat data gathering because that's part of community fatigue. So if anyone in the community says you, um, we have given this information out before. Try to find out who it was given to, because we could approach those organizations because that data is sitting in a filing cabinet somewhere. And we don't want to spend our scarce resources duplicating effort and tiring people out anyway. Let us just find out which other organization already has that information and then they can share it with us so we're dovetailing our efforts instead of constant duplication. Okay, thank you. Uh, just a comment on that, Darren. Um, one of the things to be the on, uh, uh, sorry, yeah. When when you get into the inventory, um, one okay, of the so, One, one of the important things to remember when you get into the inventory phase is that you would, you'd want the community to be engaged in a in a in a current way you know so, so while the archival materials or records might be might be useful um, one of the, the things you want to ensure is that the communities are still involved even though they might experience fatigue you want to develop a, a word that you use earlier trust you know? You want to have a constant relationship with communities. Uh, and this is going to be the challenge of it all. Uh, the focal point agencies, the state, it's a, no one likes to, to be treated in a way, or you just come to me when you need me, no? All right? Um, people want to, to re remain engaged. Um, it's a, one of the challenges of this kind of work, uh, and I'm just talking from, from some experience, is that my phone, I'm receiving messages on my phone, uh, two, three in the morning from community leaders who have an idea about something they want to, and they expect an answer, right? right? So while you might not uh, answer right away, they, they want to know that you're accessible. They want to know that, that they can see you on the street and have a conversation with you. So it, it really it really takes some, some doing. But the, the trick to it, I believe, is building capacity so widely that Groups and communities begin to speak to each other, no? Uh, you get to a point where groups and begin to speak to each other and become a support for each other, in addition to whatever mechanisms or frameworks that, that the state might, might have at its disposal, might be able to put it in place, you know? Right? Uh, if I see, you know, it, I, I could just imagine, you know, I can think of our societies. If I see Miss uh, Ms. Brenda from Binrism uh, on the street, Miss Brenda, I could see her for a second, please. I want to talk to you about something. Ms. Brenda, of course, might be doing her shopping, 
But if, if, if Brenda is able to give five minutes of the time, that might, it might just be really worth it, no? Uh, to, they, they, to hear the, what the ideas might be. And, and synergies get created over time. So it's building trust and building a relationship, but not to the point where it's unreasonable, of course, where you can't fulfill uh, some of the things. And that's important to consider what can and cannot be done right up front as well, no? Right? One of these, sometimes it's all about just, a community just want promotion, you know? want assistance with getting certain activities done. It would be very small things, but sometimes it can have exponential value to the wider society. Sorry about that. Let's go uh, back to you, Ezra. Yes, um, one, com one comment that resonated with me, and I think it may resonate with, with, with the participants, is all is around traditional games. Um, you know, I played a lot of games when I was young, and that has to, has totally gone away. And we know why. Uh, the you know we've been very we are built now. A lot of the playgrounds and places you used to marbles and so on no longer there. But traditional games is, is one area we can begin to um, to, to inventory. Um, the the person who made a comment about traditional games, I. Um, if they have some examples, maybe they can share with us, but I think it's something we should be thinking about. I remember pitching marbles, um, making um, um, scooters um, to, 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 for scooter races. Um, even, you know, and these are complicated processes. Think about the, the trap you used to make to uh, catch cra crabs, right? That's pretty sophisticated work. Also, the, the, the trap to catch birds, that's even more intense. Because you have to find the right type of wood, it has to be bent a certain way. You can have the strings also with a certain um, uh, circumference so that when a bird comes and eats seeds, it will get caught. I mean, we just—I mean, we open up a can of worm here, but there's lots and lots and lots of games that we uh, need to explore to see this around. So that I think that's a wonderful um, point of departure in terms of enumerating the things that 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 are important and in inventoring them. Um, um, we have a comment here. Um, 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 this, yeah. Just, sorry for taking up time, but this has a point of departure too, and just to offer a, a word of hope. <laughs> um, as a teacher at Sydney Catholic Secondary, I was always um, really amazed, and sometimes you think that young people are not interested. One comment that was made to me by a younger person. And I had to think about it um, for a while. Um, we, or I was saying, you know, we need to preserve our culture. And this young man got really, really upset. He said, what is our culture? You've never taught me it. It can't be mine if you don't teach it to me. You teach it to me and then it becomes mine. And he was kind of upset with me. And I could say, I couldn't really respond, but he was, was very right. Now, as, as um, students, um, when I taught them ringing games and, and got persons to come into the school and so I just was so impressed as to how much they were willing to give up. They would take their lunch really quickly and come up at the church and just play and have fun. So we may be thinking that they are not interested. That, that is not so. so. Yeah. There are a lot of young people who are willing and really want to know these things. So there is hope. And um, what we're doing here is good work. I would say it's God's work. And if we're able to put our passion together and our energies, I think it's going to create a tremendous difference. And the young people are waiting. And so I am just really excited about having this project be up and running. There's uh, one, one, one additional point I didn't see it mentioned, but is um, uh, a big Aiken tradition, you know, pastry tradition. I, like I said earlier, I, I came back to Grenada uh, last April, April, during the Easter season. And the first thing I wanted was hot cross buns. buns. And I, I couldn't find that anywhere. Hot cross buns, you can't find it anywhere. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? A right. society that had a tradition around baked goods that you know, you know came along came during Easter season. And so you have religious a religious component to it, you have a holiday celebration component to it, breakfast component to it, and then it just vanished. How is that possible? Mm. Yeah. Okay, can if we can if we can uh, begin to, to close, I know we have done 
Hola, hola, Nigel. We uh, one of the things that uh, we oh, discussed in here, a discussion is that at the end of, of, of this workshop, we, we will hear all the recommendations. We know that we are raising them as the, wor the workshop closed, but a part of that will be very good from your side as uh, Zoom and those participants who are here is to, to come back with those ideas. So we are documenting it because that, will, that nurtures the project itself and that might help us to address the project in a different way, uh, way that rather than we initially uh, establish it or thought it because you are the persons who are and in, 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 with a community and you know better the, the issues and the, and the concerns and what what you were faced what were you faced in the past and what you're facing right now so all these inputs are very are very good to be documented and one of the all the major things that we are we realize it and we still need to figure it out and think about that is how we will come together um, and different has different organizations are doing things with a platform mechanisms tool we don't know yet where, where everybody knows what what's where is happening in this moment if there's on any particular ICA element happening in a, a particular season let us know we need we need to know what's happening around uh, in each, each of the islands and if there's something that's seasonal to know the period that is happening, inviting everybody, if publish that and a public domain or some and a social media or channel that we would decide or the platform. So we don't, we're, we're not missing those initiatives and missing the efforts that are already happening. And so that's one of the, one of the points that I want to raise. Thank you. Okay, Nigel, over to you. I think you have 30 seconds to wrap up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you, um, Adriana. Um, so the, the I was wanted to respond to a comment I saw here from K. Julian Good Goto, um, referring. To, he says that I think that heritage is also a tangible physical asset, such as historical buildings, and we must find a way to preserve some of these. So I agree with you that in the context of this convention, though the the, the this is we're dealing with intangible heritage. Well, let me tell you where intangible shows up here. It might show up in, in the skills associated with preserving and, and building and constructing these types of, of structures, no? Um, you may have persons who, because I, I can tell you um, in the Caribbean, there's a problem with having those uh, skilled masons who are able to work with brick. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Especially these buildings are uh, two, 300 years. And so you, yeah. that's a skill, and I see it, so that may be passed from generation to generation. So if you have that in your territory, that's something to try and safeguard and, and get have transmitted because uh, without that skill, these structures will, will eventually um, just deteriorate further, no? So that, I just wanted to show you the connection there between tangible and intangible that way. And then I saw Tesla had a, a hand up. If, if we can close with that comment, uh, th that would be good. Sure, thank you. Thank you for letting me uh, comment again. And just listening to Ezra uh, throughout the, today's workshop, just uh, brought to mind and another aspect of this project that um, we may want to consider is that our, our Grenadian family who live in the diaspora have a completely different relationship to our traditions. And that is something that is uh, very important for the, the research that I do as well, that he said that he's 45 years away from Grenada. So his, his relationship with Grenada is, it is something completely different that a Grenadian who has been living in Grenada over time has, uh, has had a completely different experience of. So that's one of the, the places that we can look to uh, as, as repositories of really um, interesting uh, cultural traditions. And I hope that that's a, an element that's being incorporated in, into the way that we're planning this, uh, this project as well. Mm -hmm. Very, very good. Very well said the um, role of the diaspora. One of the, I have a friend, he's 87 years old and he doesn't live in, in Belize. But he has a photographic memory of his childhood. So when he's describing things, I, I don't see it in the physical, mm. but he, he sees it in his in his head. And that helps me to connect uh, my imagination with the past, no? And then I understand the heritage a little bit better. So same thing here. That's just for, thank you for that, making that observation. So for tomorrow morning then, um, Marlene, is it? 
is going to do a recap. Is that right, Ezra? Did you volunteer Marlene? Yeah, Marlene. <laughs> okay, so Marlene will, will recap some of the main concepts we, we looked at for today. And then we'll begin to get into the implementing the convention itself. We'll be looking at the who can do what in the convention. We'll be looking at awareness raising. And then we'll be looking at the inventorying and identification uh, process uh, involved. And so, so that's it for the day. And Yuri, would you want to say anything for, for, to wrap us up today? No, just, uh, just um, to share my, you know, my feelings that um, it's a, it was a real pl pleasure to, to be with you today. I, I have learned a lot and I think all the questions that, uh, that were raised by the participants are so re relevant. So we, we are getting there, we, we do understand and uh, with Nigel's support, you know, we can, we can get the spirit of the convention uh, in our spirits as well. So looking mm -hmm. forward to the next days. Thank you. All right. So, so good day so far, guys. The, um, you know, excellent. The modalities are working uh, as well as can be expected. So mm -hmm. it was an experiment. And so congratulations to the Grenada National Trust, uh, Adriana, Daryl, and um, Ezra for putting it together so far.